Hello and welcome to part 3 of the Big Soulsborne level series where I rank and review just about every level from Demon Souls, the Dark Souls trilogy, Bloodborne, Sekiro and Elden Ring. It's been a hell of a journey thus far as we travelled from the atrocious memory of the old Iron King at number 147 to the rather decent Aldeus Keep at 98 in part 1, before covering the perfectly decent memory of Amar at 97, then travelling all the way over to the superb Fishing Hamlet at number 48 in part 2. But here, now, well, we've arrived at part 3, and as such, there's no more messing around, okay? We are talking about the best of the bloody best, the creme de la creme, the bee's knees, the 47 greatest levels from these 7 great games. I would advise folk to check out parts 1 and 2 if you haven't already, especially part 1 where I went through all the criteria which led to my final choices, though it's really not necessary. You can just join right in here if you like, and welcome. But apart from that, I see no reason to hold things up for much longer. And so before I begin, please allow me to give a big old thank you to my kind patrons for their steadfast support for the channel. And with all that being said, let's kick off with level number 47. Let's begin with a red hot banger from Elden Ring, with a legacy dungeon situated within the heart of Mount Gelmir, its Volcano Manor. For a few Elden Ring locations I've covered thus far on the list, I've made a point of mentioning that they're optional, places like Castle Morn or Caria Manor, but really, that's kind of a superfluous detail when we're talking about Elden Ring, because the vast majority of it is completely optional. You never even need to set foot in Stormvale Castle if you don't want to, although the idea of an Elden Ring playthrough where you don't visit Stormvale Castle is just about enough to make me physically sick. As for Mount Gelmir, or more specifically Volcano Manor, yep, you're never really directly directed there as part of your main quest. I mean, Gideon Ofnir does tell you about Lord Rykard and there are side quests associated with the place, but you can just skip it if you really want, if you're some kind of chump or something, some kind of one-pump chump. What? Personally though, when I first ascended the Grand Lift of Dectus and saw that dark, jagged landscape on the horizon, my curiosity could not have been greater, and so off I went past the abductor virgins before climbing the mountain and fighting my way through the full grown falling star beast before finding myself in the volcano manor, an abode of warm elegance, standing in stark contrast to the coarse volcanic chaos present throughout the rest of the mountain. However, that initial elegance and style that greets you at the entrance very quickly gives way to much the same degree of blasphemy and madness found everywhere else, into a rotting town filled with cruel serpents, dark dungeons where half-mad Albanorix sits suspended in cruel devices of torture, and even sections where the architecture has flat out yielded to raw volcanism, requiring the player to climb up platforms and footholds of dark igneous rock past fire slugs and fire serpents, and all manner of blasphemous idols and adornments, further on to the portal to Rykard's morbid lair. If you can't tell yet by the way I'm talking about it, I think Volcano Manor is pretty freaking sick, and very unique to the rest of the lands between, with its own culture and dark history, having divorced itself of the sway of the Erd Tree and the Golden Order to instead embrace the path of the blasphemous serpent. Once again, for want of a better adjective, it's sick as hell, and the chaos and misery found throughout the level is so thick and pronounced, even when compared to the overwhelming grim decay found throughout the rest of the game world. It's not exactly my favourite level in the game to play through, largely because the layout itself feels a bit chaotic and thrown together, and also, while the lava looks cool, the coolness kind of wears off in the parts where you have to walk through it because it does that same stupid lost Isolith thing again where you take constant chip damage, except here you can't even sprint or quick roll through it. It looked bad in Lost Isolith and it looks bad here, though I shan't make a Mount Gelmir out of a molehill because for the most part you will be moving on conventional terrain, which feels just fine. Let's continue with another Elden Ring Legacy dungeon with Mikula's Halic Tree. I already covered Elphiel Brace of the Halo Tree back a bit at number 57, but before progressing on to that more militaristic level with its soldiers, knights and defences, gotta make it through the more untamed section just before it, where instead of soldiers, there are ants, and instead of knights, there are heralds. Not to mention the various other unwanted monstrosities roaming the roots and guarding the rough structures constructed around the base of the Halo Tree. Unlike Elfail, which very much feels intricately laid out with multiple routes through it, complete with elevator shortcuts and different vertical levels, Mikawa's Halo Tree feels far more linear. 
Really, it's just a matter of getting through it, past the many formidable enemies barring progress, through the unconventional terrain. Right from the start, you're moving along branches with opportunities for platforming down to other branches, and while the presence of actual structures does increase as you get closer to Loretta at night of the Haley Tree, it always feels at least partially precarious to walk upon, which is exactly how I think it should feel. I'm not saying I relish the experience of dodging ants and bubble projectiles whilst trying to navigate across narrow branches, but I do appreciate the idea of the enormous tree growing first, followed by these odd structures and paths being built around its stunted form. It's not a huge level in its own right, feeling more like a particularly dangerous and perilous path leading up to the much larger Elfail, but even so, I actually prefer it somewhat to Elfail. Sadly, there aren't any totally new enemies here to speak of, although a new Oracle variant is introduced. But even so, Mikola's Halo Tree manages to feel that bit fresher and less fatiguing than the level after it, and the constant sight of the stunted Halo Tree in the background makes for an excellent visual flourish. It's been a damn dog's age since I covered a Sekiro level in this list. In fact, the last one was Sunken Valley Passage back at number 79, but here at number 45, we have the Ashina Outskirts. Kind of a tricky level to rank, to be honest, because in truth, it feels more like a long transitional level composed of smaller sub-levels than one large level with a central theme and personality, but even so, for what it is, it's damn great. The Ashna Outskirts is an early game level of course, entered after Wolf's first visit to the Sculptor and concluding with a wild battle with Gyobu Oniwa who guards the castle gates. Being an early game level, it's essentially laid out as a series of fairly open areas presenting various challenges and opportunities for stealth and straight combat, providing rooftops, ledges, tall grass and various other grapple points to see how many samurai you can nail without being seen, dispatching them all one by one as per the way of the shinobi. The way of the shadow. Or in my case, just run straight into the first enemy I see and instantly get detected and killed. These stealth oriented sections are all good and fun, though for me it's the mini bosses that I always think back fondly upon when I think of the Ashen outskirts, like the first general you see who is exactly as difficult as he should be. And then you have that other general further ahead who I absolutely struggled with on my first playthrough. Oh my god, this dude's hard when you're not familiar with his moveset. My favourite of them all though happens to be the Ogre. I know a lot of people had major problems with the Ogre at launch. I saw many a death montage of new players being repeatedly smashed into the ground by its super quick grab attacks. And let's not forget the people's elbow move it sometimes throws out. Personally though, I absolutely love fighting the ogre. His range of moves is relatively small, but very dangerous, but once you get him figured out, it's just great fun nailing the dodges and occasionally blasting him with fire from the flame barrel. I did specify during my initial criteria discussion that I wouldn't be considering bosses when assessing level quality, but as well as Sekiro's main bosses, it also has a plethora of mini bosses who I think are fair game to consider especially the way they're situated throughout the game's levels, often just patrolling an area with no fanfare to initiate the fight. I also can't talk about the outskirts without also mentioning the giant serpent, though this section really is all about the spectacle. It's hardly very engaging from a gameplay standpoint. You don't really need to think about how to evade it here, but rather you just keep moving along the obvious path and then stab its eye out from the palanquin. It looks incredible, and the way it thrashes around coupled with the crazy sound design is awesome. Or at least it was until I fell into the abyss and respawned back at the start, only to realise that it will infinitely replay that same 4 second animation and sound loop until you progress here, which kinda diminished the awesome factor a bit. Regardless, Ashina Outskirts is a terrific sequence of set pieces and combat challenges. At the end of the magnificent level that is the Dragon Eerie, you have the Dragon Shrine, which is far more refined and developed when compared to the towering crags of the Eerie just before it. Another main difference between the Eerie and the Shrine is that save for the ancient dragon who rests at its highest point, there are no other actual dragons here, but rather the place is filled with dragon knights and drake keepers formidable warriors who stand sentinel throughout the shrine to test the mettle of any chosen undead who deign to enter its ancient draconic grounds. In vanilla Dark Souls 2 there really weren't that many dragon knights in the level, but there were a bunch more drake keepers and getting through it was pretty much as straightforward as just killing the enemies. 
same as you would any other level, but on Scholar of the First Sin, they changed it up quite a bit. In Scholar, there are significantly more Dragon Knights, except they won't attack you unless you flee from a fight with a Drake Keeper, in which case, this happens as you try to climb the stairs to the boss, it's a bit much. Thing is though, I had no idea this was a thing. I must have missed the damn memo, and I was mocked mercilessly for not knowing my business when I put out my Dark Souls 2 retrospective a few months ago. All that aside though, the Dragon Shrine is just a great level. It's not even close to being the largest or most complex level in Soulsborne, or even in Dark Souls 2, but what it lacks in size, it more than makes up for in presence and personality, and in particular, the enemies here are brilliant. Both the Drake Keepers and Dragon Knights are top tier enemies with top tier designs, and often the presence of just one or two outstanding enemy types is enough to significantly elevate the experience of moving through a level. At the end of the Seofra Aqueduct, and after defeating everyone's favourite double boss fight against the Valiant Gargoyles, there is a mystical coffin of magic, which, upon entering into its cold stone, ascends higher to a new level entirely, one located directly beneath Lendel Royal Capital, its deep root depths. If I had to name another level which Deep Root Depths feels most similar to, I'd probably say Mogwin Palace. Both levels are large underground locations where you can even ride around on torrent, though instead of a blood swamp, most of Deep Root Depths surface shines with shallow pools of some pale milky fluid that gives the place a very distinctive aesthetic, especially with it being set against the thick brown haze of the background, complemented by distant sprawling branches and tree roots. When it comes to their visuals, Elden Ring's underground levels rarely disappoint. To explore, while it actually feels much more like a mini region than a regular level with how large it is, especially when you consider the walking mausoleum stomping around. Most of its expanse is very open, particularly in the later, lower section, but there are also clusters of tree roots and architecture which can be platformed along, dodging ants and broken gargoyles. Really though, I haven't put deep root depths as high as this because of how mechanically satisfying it feels to move through, but rather because it's very atmospherically satisfying. This place feels so fascinating and ancient with its untamed profusion of roots and the roaming bands of headless ghost enemies. Then you have the Crucible Knight Saluria standing sentinel over at a broken tree in the corner, and it's all just very rich and flavourful. I always enjoy roaming around down here before climbing a bit higher to visit the Prince of Death. At number 42, I have the Kiln of the First Flame. This is one of those levels which might possibly spark mild or major outrage in the comments, with me not having it significantly higher, but what can I say? I think this is the place it deserves, and 42 out of 147 sure ain't nothing to sniff at. As far as its presentation goes, the Kiln of the First Flame gets a straight 10 out of 10. For a start, the reveal that this final level has been right underneath your feet at Firelink Shrine the whole time is brilliant, and that feeling as you're descending those nearly heavenly looking stairs with the Silver Knight spirits visible at either side is something else, and then you step out into that vast, scorched kiln where Gwyn linked his soul to the first flame to prolong the Age of Fire, which is once again fading unless some new powerful being chooses to sacrifice their own powerful soul. Again, presentation wise it's masterfully done, and I love how you see every variant of Black Knight along the way, and you can even pick up the Black Knight set at one section, but the fact remains that this level is completely linear. As vast as it looks, it's essentially just a straight path with no potential for exploration other than to grab the armour. Also, although I'm not too sure if it's fair to mention here with it partly pertaining to the boss of the level, I think the fact that you need to run back through the whole level every time you die to Gwyn is pretty terrible. Now that doesn't make the level itself terrible, or even bad, but it is a relevant aspect of the level which can contribute to one getting a wee bit sick of it by the time you eventually take Gwyn down. Even so, the Kiln of the First Flame is a legendary area that does feel great to move through, hosting a collection of the toughest, most enjoyable enemies in the game. It's not a perfect level, but nonetheless, it's great. Let's go back to another Elden Ring level for number 41, to Crumbling Faram Azula. I just spoke about the importance of presentation there for Dark Souls 1's final level, and for Crumbling Faram Azula, I think I need to be handing out yet another 10 out of 10, cause holy cow, this place looks unreal. 
For as much as I adore how most of FromSoft's levels look, it's pretty damn rare that they actually unnerve me. But this place absolutely unnerves me to the point where it makes me downright uncomfortable in places. Not because of any spooky ghosts or bony, bony skeletons, but because of the whole tornado thing. These tornadoes are terrifying to look at, especially with how close they feel in some parts. It's the same sort of fear some parts of the outer wilds gives me, in particular the black hole at Brittle Hollow and literally everything about Giant's Deep. The whole level is a damn aesthetic marvel with its ancient shattered architecture, gravitational anomalies and the draconic parade constantly circumnavigating the level who you can even see represented on the world map. To explore though, well, it's massive and furthermore the level is about exactly as not straightforward as it looks. Many of its sections feel non-linear to move through, and even when there is essentially just one way forward, you'll very rarely get there via anything even resembling a straight path, but rather via platforming across crumbling terrain, fighting through beastmen, stormhawks and even worm faces along the way. A pretty valid complaint about Elden Ring is that towards the end it can get a bit fatiguing, for multiple reasons. For one, the late game regions and levels tend not to be anywhere near as fresh and exciting when it comes to enemy variety, although with Farama Zula in particular, that's not really a fair criticism thanks to all the beastmen enemies, and there's even undead beastmen in a couple of places. Another reason for late game fatigue that can be somewhat more fairly attributed to this level though is how steeply the difficulty ramps up, and yeah, I definitely felt this back in my first playthrough. For me, for Amazur was around the first time where my sky high stats and awesome gear suddenly start feeling so impressive as the number of enemies the game threw at me grew, same with their health and damage output. I shan't bitch too much about the difficulty though, cause you lot are going to start thinking I'm some sort of scrub. For as impressively put together as this level is, with its utterly unconventional layout and level design, it can get somewhat tiresome to move through at times, not only due to the challenge posed by the enemies, especially that bloody Stormhawk bit, but also because of the very nature of the layout. I appreciate how the level is put together with the floating stone platforms and such, but I don't quite love the act of moving through it because its incoherent nature takes away from some of that simple satisfaction derived from moving through more conventional level types. I know this is a pretty random comparison to make, uh, but compare Crumbling Faram Azula to the gates of Boletaria from Demon Souls. The former level is way more complex and interesting than the first level of Boletaria, but I find the latter level to be way more enjoyable and satisfying to move through. Still, the fact remains that Farama Zula has scored very well on my list at 41, so I don't think I dislike it or anything. I still think it's great with some fantastic moments, but I've always found that its level design and layout is a bit too ambitious for its own good. Ok, so you've probably heard me say the word atmosphere about 40 bloody times so far through this series, at least, but look, how could I not? These games simply have some of the best atmospheres in all of gaming. It's just one of the many excellent things they're well known for, and of all seven games covered in this series, I think Bloodborne achieves stratospheric heights when it comes to presenting thick, delicious atmosphere in its levels. Atmospheres so thick you can practically taste and smell them through the screen. And one of the best examples of this is Hemwick Charnel Lane. Another totally optional level for some reason, but if upon reaching the Grand Cathedral you decide to make a left turn, the churches, alleys and plazas of the Cathedral Ward very quickly fade from view, being replaced by numerous blunderbuss wheeling yarnamites, savage dogs and unless your insight happens to be at zero, these sickle wielding mad one enemies. Furthermore, apart from later on in Yahar Ghul, Henwick Charnel Lane is the only level in the game with these female villager type enemies who look far less bestial than their male counterparts, though they're just as vicious. Really cool thing I discovered back on my playthrough from a few months ago is that they have unique death dialogue if you kill them with fire. Very cool detail. The female touch really is part of what makes Hemlock Channel Lane feel and sound so distinctively atmospheric. Right as you enter, you're just greeted by all this smoke and ash, complemented hideously by the wild shrieks and laughter of the womenfolk, and it's so great. 
The level feels fantastic to move through, through the barns and over the roofs, dodging molotovs, activating shortcuts and then onto the grassy section with the three executioners prowling round before taking on the, sadly, kinda lame level boss, but I shan't let that sell in my opinion of the level itself. For number 39, let's return back to Sekiro for a bit, to Harata Estate. This level has a sort of vague similarity to Old Yarnum from Bloodborne in that although it seems like a mandatory level, it's actually completely optional. You don't need to collect a bell from the old lady in Ashina Outskirts and even if you do, you don't have to use it or get to the end to beat Lady Butterfly. That is unless you're going for the purification ending, in which case, yes, you must visit Harata at least twice. You simply must. All that said though, I'm sure for most the level's optional status is irrelevant because it's a great level with a great boss, and the whole affair has massive significance to the game's story. Although it looks and feels different to move through, Harata Estate is kinda similar in nature to Ashina Outskirts, which I discussed earlier in that again, it's a long level that feels more like a sequence of set pieces for traversal, stealth and raw combat challenges, and as such, the feel of the level changes quite a bit from start to end. Something I really like about Harata Estate is the way it complements Ashina Outskirts, because you are heavily encouraged to switch from one level to the other at certain points, like how the game communicates to you that the ogre is afraid of fire, and gives you intel telling you that a flame barrel can be found at Harata. So you go over there and do the first portion and get the flame barrel, then go back and beat the ogre. Then you can return to Harata and push on through a bit more, but things are more difficult with more enemies, including some very tough ones like the Shinobi Hunters, before things get tougher still at the end with Juzo the Drunkard and his gang of bandits, not to mention Lady Butterfly, so it might be best to return to the outskirts to get more prayer beads and maybe take down Gyobu Oriwa for a memory to increase your damage potential, then go back to Harata. It's all very nicely and neatly structured and it feels great moving back and forth to this level as and when appropriate. Also, if you're going for the purification ending, then you can come back to Harata at the end where, just like with Ashina Reservoir, the threat level is increased with harder mini bosses before an especially hard main boss. What more can I say about Harata? It's just a damn good level from Sekiro. At an odd, partly outdoor section of Erythel Dungeon, you can come across a collection of dead knights, bowed over and facing outwards to some distant stone structure atop a mountain peak, but at this point, there's nothing more to do here. After defeating King Asyros and pushing further through his boss arena though, you can learn the path of the dragon gesture which can then be used at this spot, causing your character to lose consciousness before waking up on Arch Dragon Peak, an ancient stone shrine populated by serpents and wyverns. I guess Arch Dragon Peak is kind of the painted world Ariamis of Dark Souls 3, being optional and hidden away, yet very impressive in scale and design. It for sure feels as, if not more impressive than many of the game's mandatory levels, and certainly more impressive than a couple of its other optional ones like the Demon Ruins and the Consumed King's Garden. Normally in this series I would try and keep any discussion of bosses to a reasonable minimum, but in this case I think bringing up the first level boss of Arch Dragon Peak is perfectly allowable, because a main requirement for the fight involves traversing through the respectably large first portion of the level, ascending higher up the crumbling stone stairs and fighting through hordes of fireball spewing, chain hurling serpents of varying size. The Ancient Wyvern itself is hardly an incredible opponent, but the actual level design here is excellent, and after the boss battle the level of quality remains high. This level sucks. Seriously though, I am really glad they introduced brand new enemy types for the level rather than recycling stuff you've already seen. Though once again, it's not without its callbacks, featuring a pretty sick fight against Havel who's back again for some reason, or at least it's some dude wearing his armour, looming over the corpse of a Wyvern. This bit near the end though, near the entrance to the boss fight with the Nameless King, is probably the most difficult individual section of any base game level. There are so many serpents here, including a number of the big dudes who can be really challenging even on their own. They're kinda like Dark Souls 3's answer to the shark giants from Bloodborne, although not quite as terrifying or loud. I've even been known to skip this part entirely after dying one too many times, or getting bashed off the edge by one of those rock lizard things after trying to pick up the dragon chaser's ashes. Screw you rock lizard thing. Now that we're talking about the creme de la creme, Demon Souls levels are going to be showing up more frequently, cause simply put, Demon Souls has some sick fucking levels. 
And indeed, at number 37, we have Island's Edge, the first level of the Shrine of Storms. We already discussed the Ritual Path back at 68, which shares some of the same attributes with the first level of the Shrine of Storms, except it's comparatively darker and more constricted in its design. But as for Island's Edge, everything feels that bit more novel, and certainly more visually impressive. I'm showing footage from the remake here of course, but even in the original this was a great looking level in pretty much every respect. For a start, I love the unique metallic design of the skeletons, and how they come in silver, gold or black depending on their threat level. In fact, despite skeletons also featuring heavily in every Dark Souls game and Elden Ring, FromSoft have never managed to match or surpass how sick these ones look. They're not quite so much a pleasure to fight, mind you, and I've certainly been known to get frustrated as hell at being bloody rolled to death or sniped with a magic arrow from a distance, but even so, big respect to these dudes. They're not even the most noteworthy enemy in the level either, because I think that accolade has to go to the Storm Beasts. At first, you just see them in the distance, these strange manta ray looking creatures flowing through the air. Their movements are even kind of beautiful in a way, kind of elegant, but their charm can quite quickly wear off once they start nailing you with magic projectiles. It can absolutely get annoying, especially if you get complacent and stop paying attention to the sound cues whilst trying to navigate and fight your way past more skeletons, or the massive vanguard demon hanging out in the middle of the level. But annoying or not, their presence gives the level that extra bit of unique alien flavour. Although it does have one or two troublesome sections, Island's Edge exhibits a lot about what made Demon Souls level design so great, both in its visuals and its layout, though at the same time both it and the Ritual Path are kinda exceptional in that neither of these levels have any shortcuts to the boss, forcing you to replay through the whole affair if you die, which can suck a bit. Shortcut or not though, this level is well deserving of a place in the top 40. We've got another Sekiro level here at number 36, and it's yet another long one, and another very pretty one, very attractive, if I may be so bold as to say so. At the end of the morbid, murky trudge through the abandoned dungeon, with its swarms of scuttling insects and undying test subjects, I'm sure most players feel very much in need of a change of scenery, a cleaner level to wash away the negative vibes of the dungeon, which makes it feel so damn nice when you fully ascend the lift and make it to Mount Congo, a sprawling, stunning environment of tall trees, bright leaves and breathtaking mountainous views. As is nearly always the case, in from soft games though, just cause a level looks nice as hell, doesn't mean there isn't a heaping helping of horror found throughout, cause Senpu Temple certainly has its fair share of horror. As the talking tapestry explains at the beginning, the monks of the level have abandoned the teachings of Buddha in their avaricious pursuit of immortality, though as can be seen at various points along the mountain, the particular brand of immortality found here is both disgusting and horrific, immortality via infestation, via the worm. Barely living, half mummified corpse monks vomit out rancid swarms of insects as you pass. Grotesque clawed freaks lie in wait within dingy candlelit structures ready to rend and tear, and in the main temple hall at the peak of the mountain awaits the monks within whom the centipede infestations have fully matured, striking out at the player and even giving the priests morbid motion, scuttling around the broken tiled floor. It's all disgusting, disturbing and fucking awesome, especially when set against the bright, lush backdrop of the mountain. It's horror set against beauty. To actually play through, the dealio here is very similar to several other Sekiro levels, which feel like long sequences of set pieces for stealth and combat, with the occasional challenging mini-boss chucked in, and the odd NPC to chat with. I will say though that when compared to the samurai found throughout Central Ashina, not to mention the powerful interior ministry enemies seen later on in that level, the monks of Senpu have never felt quite as fun to fight for me, perhaps because for the most part they fight barehanded, which ironically kinda lacks the punch and impact found in the game's sword battles. Also, I found that just spamming the attack button tends to work disappointingly well against them compared to most other enemies in the game. Even so, this is a great level that feels very enjoyable to move through, providing an excellent change of pace from the comparatively more militaristic and stony structures of Central Ashina. Now, the gutter is a level that gives me great pleasure to place so highly, because it's actually a level I used to detest. 
when I first entered into it and saw how bloody dark it all was and saw all the decrepit terrain and enemies obscured amidst the shadows, I groaned. I went like this. <sighs> it looked like Blighttown, except an even bigger pain in the arse. And as such, I just couldn't be arsed. Then I'd inevitably try and just sprint through the place and then get lost and or die. Frustration and scorn towards the level growing substantially every time. But years later I realised I was simply approaching the level incorrectly. I was trying to fit a square peg into a round hole and then getting mad when it wouldn't go through. This level is all about progressively lighting the way forward so as to gradually make the environment feel more navigable and less treacherous. At first it's dark as hell and as such dangerous as hell but there are sconces everywhere throughout and lighting them really makes a difference to how the level looks and feels. Thus if you make your way say halfway through the gutter lighting every sconce along the way and then die, well thanks to this level mechanic the frustration usually inherent to dying feels substantially lessened because when you're next run through the level it's going to feel easier now that you've lit the way forward in a process of progressive illumination. Don't get me wrong, no matter which way you spin it, the gutter is a treacherous level with many opportunities for death and even frustration, but as treacherous as its terrain may be, and for as devoid of brightness and beauty as it certainly is, I think this is one of Dark Souls 2's best freaking levels, and I'm really glad I eventually came to realise that, after literally 6 years of thinking it was terrible. So at this point in the list, I've covered every Soulsborn tutorial level except for one all except for Dark Souls 1's Undead Asylum. Might seem like a bit of a strange choice to be placing so damn high above so many other great levels, but hey, what I said back in my intro at the very start of the list was that my ultimate criteria for determining the placement of a level was how much I enjoy playing through it. Many factors go into my decisions, some obvious and some subtle, but if you don't enjoy a level, then who gives a fuck about all that? And I really enjoy the Undead Asylum. Even though there are several other Dark Souls levels that are more ambitious and which positively drip with atmosphere, the Undead Asylum has a special kind of magic, regardless of its rather drab aesthetic. I shan't lie though and will happily confess that a big reason for my affection is that it was the very first FromSoft level I ever experienced. Demon's Souls pretty much passed me by completely when it was first released, not least of all because I didn't have a PS3 and so couldn't even play it anyway, but when Dark Souls arrived on the scene there was a hell of a lot of buzz around it, which is extra impressive when you consider that it came out just a week and a half after Skyrim. I won't lie and claim that I was hooked right from the beginning or anything because I wasn't, in fact my first experience with Dark Souls was awful, filled with frustration and outrage at the difficulty, and I even straight up just sold the game after getting my arse handed to me one too many times by the bell gargoyles, but around 18 months after that I repurchased the game and let's just say things clicked for me this time round and the rest is history and here I am with my YouTube channel where I just talk about Dark Souls all the time, life's good. Didn't mean to tell you my fucking life story though, because we're talking about the Undead Asylum, a level I have an immense amount of nostalgia for. That first moment when the Asylum Demon jumps down from above and absolutely pounds your character into a paste is a special moment indeed, and even when you go up against some basic hollows with their broken swords or bows, you might quickly start to realise that this is a different sort of game to what you might be used to. I remember looking at the damage enemies were doing with their basic attacks and thinking there had to be some mistake. Did I pick the hardest difficulty setting by accident? Hold on, there was no difficulty settings. Well then what the fuck do I do? Ah! Now I know the difficulty of Dark Souls does tend to get overblown somewhat, but a significant reason for that is just how jarring it can be to enter into this brutal world of high damage and death where the punishment for a mistake is so much more severe than it is in most other games, and it all starts in the Undead Asylum. It's not all grim though, because there are some softer moments too like when you meet up with a dying Oscar who gifts you with your first Estes flasks and a key, though you can of course later return here and actually take on Oscar who has gone fully hollow by that point, which is well worth doing because he's got a great shield. There's been a few other levels throughout the list which get more difficult with more enemies when you return to them later on, particularly from Sekiro, but the same thing is true of the Undead Asylum which boasts more challenging torch hollows later on and even a black knight looming ominously in the distance, guarding the peculiar doll. 
Not a massive level, not a super ambitious one, certainly not the prettiest one either, but it's a very effective one, acting as a superb beginning to one of the best games ever made, and it's even fun to come back to later on. Good job on Dead Asylum. Good job. At number 33, we have the single most beautiful level in Sekiro, it's Fountainhead Palace. Folks, I'm an absolute sucker for a pretty level. I can be just as easily rendered dumbstruck as the next chump at the sight of some bright, colourful vista, and the scene that greets the player upon them stepping out through the exit of the corrupted monk boss arena truly is one of the most stunning of any game on this list. Not only does it look gorgeous though, but it plays pretty damn well too, with its own unique enemies who add yet another layer of charm to the level, especially if you hold off on brutally executing them for a second to watch them frolic, dance and kick around a ball though they're anything but playful to actually fight, being very tough to beat with a very distinctive dance-like combat style, and let's not forget that they're one of the few enemies in the game capable of using lightning attacks. As for their counterparts, the palace nobles, well these suckers are a great deal less charming, though arguably more dangerous in a sense, being capable of sucking the youth from Wolf to render him enfeebled, a status just a single step away from death. As such, stealth is absolutely crucial throughout this level. Stealth is an important mechanic in general in Sekiro of course, though the need for it does feel a bit lessened in some levels where the enemies feel weaker but are greater in number, but upon stalking through Fountainhead Palace's watery halls, I really had to step up my stealth game to avoid both the soul-sucking gazes of the nobles and the acrobatic attacks of the Okami warriors. I'm sure there might be some people watching who would have put Fountainhead Palace way higher than 33 in their own list, but for as beautiful as it might look, I don't quite consider it to be ideal to play through. For a start, there's a hell of a lot of water here which must be entered to push onwards through the level, past the giant carp. While the swimming mechanics in Sekiro are actually pretty damn decent when compared to most games, I still don't quite love it, and I'd love the double boss fight with the two headless even less, though thankfully that one is optional. Even as I'm saying this though, it does seem like a bit of a hollow gripe, because the water reversal is introduced very well here, the way you can't safely enter the water at all unless you dispatch the Akame warrior on the tree. It's pretty great. I guess I don't really have any proper complaints about Fountainhead Palace, but even so, I've just never loved moving through it quite enough to consider it one of the all-time greatest levels, but it's a great level nonetheless, and very easy on both the eyes and ears. Let's not forget its beautiful soundtrack. Dark Souls 3 is well known for its many references to the first game in the trilogy, some of which are minor whilst others are very much major, and whilst the Grand Archives isn't quite as big a self-reference as An Orlando, it's clear that FromSoft were to some extent paying homage to the Duke's archives from Dark Souls 1. That's not to say that it feels at all similar to actually move through it though, because comparatively the Grand Archives is much larger and certainly more confusing. One of the reasons for this is its very unconventional layout, with some sections essentially feeling like a maze of bookshelves, many of which hide thralls or wax scholars waiting in ambush, though in addition to the regular enemies of the level, you also have the downright obnoxious presence of the second of the game's two crystal sages, constantly firing powerful crystal sorcery at you from range. This is a clear homage to the channelers from the Duke's archives, so the crystal sage is way harder to deal with, and much more annoying teleporting away after you deal a portion of damage, forcing you to continue the hunt whilst being barraged with more crystal soul spears, homing crystal soul masses and white dragon breath. And all this is happening as you're fighting off thralls on the occasional night and trying to navigate your way up and through the grand archives to the top so as to make it to Prince Lothric's high chambers. I think an excellent word to describe the grand archives is dense. It is dense with enemies and hazards and objects and shortcuts, and it even has its own unique level mechanic with the pools of wax throughout the level which you can dunk your character's head in. Although the purpose of doing this might initially be lost on you, because it's kind of odd, it's an odd thing to do, this will nullify the curse buildup caused by the creepy arms which grasp up at you from open books at some sections of the level. 
Curse was horrendous in Dark Souls 1 and then they nerfed the hell out of it in Dark Souls 2 before making it much more dangerous again in Dark Souls 3, though without the whole having your max HP aspect this time, thankfully. When I think of the Grand Archives, the first thing I usually think of is all the books and stuff at the bottom, but stuff gets way more intense at the top as you fight more Lothric Knights and even some Gargoyles, not to mention this section with the three winged knights sporting one of the gnarliest armour sets in the game and now in possession of actual wings, also giving them an expanded moveset. There are a ton of awesome moments in this level and a plethora of clever navigational tricks and shortcuts to make the ascension all the more interesting, and it's all very bloody challenging too, just as the lead up to the incredible fight with the twin princes ought to be. And here we have the first time so far in the list where I get to name what I consider to be the best level from its respective game, which in this case is Ashina Castle. I love castles, even ones which look nothing like any of the castles from the other games. We've already covered the excellent Ashina outskirts, but just ahead of the large battleground where Gyobu Oniwa is fought lies Ashina Castle, that towering graceful structure which is home to many samurai, knight jars and most importantly, Ishin Ashina and his adopted grandson Gunichiro. There's more to the castle than just the interior though, because you've also got the surrounding area which is dense with alleys, miscellaneous structures and a network of rooftops, all of which provide excellent opportunities for stealth takedowns on unwitting samurai. Stealth is extra important at the top of the stairs too, because again there's one of those fearsome generals who again is surrounded by weaker enemies, heavily encouraging the sly use of the shuriken wheel before plunging downward to remove half his health in one fell blow. God damn this game is sick. As much as I enjoy the exterior, it's the interior I like even more, and while the layout of it is somewhat a part of that, in this case it's very much the enemies who maketh the level, in particular these fencers. FromSoft really are the undisputed kings at designing intimidating looking enemies, with memorable designs and formidable movesets. You'll see plenty of your regular sword wielding samurai, even some with rifles and spears, but these enemies are on a different level of threat and refinement, even using proper techniques like Ichimonji, and as for the Ashina elite mini boss guarding the way further up the castle with his lightning fast flurries and sweeps, well folks, for me all these elements add up to what I consider to be the best level in Sekiro, and yet again we have another case where everything's even harder later on in the game when the interior ministry invades with their heavy shinobi warriors and flame sprayers, leading up to the fight with great bosses like Great Shinobi Owl, or if you decide to screw everyone over, Ishin and Emma. Awesome freaking level which gives me exactly what I want from Sekiro, great stealth opportunities, formidable samurai to face, and a castle. Oof, here we go, let's talk Blight Town. Let's talk about this sprawling, blighted town of infested ghouls and barbarians, and at the bottom, in the Poison Swamp, many people's first Poison Swamp, which would make them detest every subsequent Poison Swamp in this series, things become that bit more wild and chaotic, with fire spraying crag spiders and giant leeches. And let's not forget Manita Mildred who's roaming around the place half naked. She's pretty terrifying in her own right. For me, the depths were a distressing level on my first playthrough, sending me ever further down from the relative safety of the surface, away from the sun and from the more recognisable aspects of the game world, but if I expected any sort of reprieve from the darkness after defeating the gaping dragon, then I was sorely, sorely mistaken, because Blight Town is so much larger, more confusing and dangerous than any other level up until this point. Conventional paths? Walkways? Hallways? Rooms? Fuck off! We're in Blighttown where things are barely held together by planks of wood and swamp sludge, with the occasional wooden power to keep it all from falling down, all connected by sometimes difficult to spot ladders. Descending further down this place is a damn trial, especially on your first playthrough where you have no idea what might constitute the safest, most optimal path. So the odd death or two from falls is inevitable, and that's if the ghouls and toxic blow darts don't get you first, especially with the fact that they made it so it's really difficult to see what the hell's even hitting you, never mind where they came from. The entire Blight Town experience is oppressive, precarious and challenging, but at the same time I have massive respect for it. 
It's so fucking huge and there are so many wee sections and corners to explore and hidden items and weapons tucked away so that you can pass through the level many times and there'll still be parts of it you've never seen. Up some ladder you never noticed or down some platform you never thought to jump from. One of the main criticisms you used to hear all the time about Blight Town was its frame rate. Because bear in mind that Dark Souls was exclusively out for the PS3 and Xbox 360 upon its initial release, and indeed, those systems were barely able to handle the ambition of Blight Town, resulting in massive slowdown while exploring it. Personally, though, I never even noticed back in the day when I first played the game. I heard people complaining about the frame rate, but I didn't even know what frame rate was back then, and it was only when I saw the complaints online that I thought, oh yeah, I guess the performance of the game does get utterly crippled when I get to this specific level. Oh well. Hardly a problem for the kids these days though, eh? With all their PS5s and their AMD 10,000s and their TikToks. Anyway, really not sure what people will think about me placing Blight Town so high, because it's the kind of level where if someone told me they absolutely hated it, I'd get it. But personally, I think this level is crucial to the greater Dark Souls experience. I can't imagine the game without it. Way back at number 108, I had Darkroot Basin, with the Hydra and the Crystal Golems and the Black Knight and so on and so forth. I didn't dislike anything about the level, really, but I guess it just didn't quite do enough to make me put it much higher. But here, significantly higher on the list at number 29, I have Darkroot Garden, which makes up the rest of the general Darkroot area. Even with it being separate from Darkfruit Basin, this level is still made up of its own distinct portions. In order to make it into the main area, got by the crest of Artorias from Andre just a bit back of the Undead Parish, but even aside from that, you can always take the right hand path through to one of my favourite wee sections in the game, which then leads up and onto the Moonlight Butterfly boss. All the sleeping stone statues here are so damn sick, the way they slowly get up before something's casting tranquil walk of peace to slow your movements. This is such a magical wee side path, with its weird walking trees and these… whatever the fuck these things are. This is also where you pick up one of the most legendary of all Dark Souls armors with the Elite Knight set. Good times. As for the Forest Hunter's Woods, well, it massively succeeds where Dark Souls 2's levels often failed in that while it is heavily PvP focused, you can completely ignore that aspect of it and still really enjoy it. It can be intimidating if you enter the ground too early though, because these ghostly human enemies can be really tough, from the heavy armoured claymore wielding knight, to the axe wielding brigand, to the catalyst wielding sorcerer, and more still, though if you've the stones for it, this can also act as a more than decent early game soul farming segment. I really enjoy fighting these human type enemies, though I have an even greater appreciation and even affection for some of the stranger inhabitants of the forest, particularly the mushroom people, survivors from the golden age of Ulusil, though these ones are a bit less friendly, watch out for their punch. Darkroot Garden is vintage Dark Souls, it's a fine forest vintage. I love walking its wild and varied expanse with its many treasures and interesting enemies, and even if you're not going to engage with the PvP side of things, it's still well worth joining the Forest Hunter's clan so as to meet Shiva of the East and browse his impressive selection of rare weapons, both here and later on in Blight Town. Like the gutter from Dark Souls 2, the new Londo Ruins is a level that I used to really not appreciate. It's dark as hell and very treacherous, with countless opportunities to fall to your water rate death, though it was the main enemies of the level, those being the ghosts and the banshees, that I really did not enjoy contending with because there are a damn lot of them, they have great range with their melee attacks, and in order to actually deal damage to them or even block their attacks, you have to use a consumable called the Transient Curse. However, I did eventually grow to appreciate them as an enemy. There's nothing else like them in the game, and their presence down here seriously adds to the haunted, drowned atmosphere of the place, especially when you see them slowly floating towards you from the distance, or even just flat out emerging from the walls or ground. The transient curse mechanic really isn't all that taxing either to be honest, I mean, they last 5 minutes at a time, which is pretty decent, and also I've never came close to running out of them on any playthrough, though just booking it through the level is always an option. The new Londo Ruins does come in two main portions though, because after reaching Ingward and getting the key to the seal, the whole lower section can be drained by opening the floodgates to the Valley of the Drakes, making for a really awesome moment the first thing you see it, and realise that the two levels are directly connected. The lower section is very different though and way more dangerous. 
For a start, the main threat isn't ghosts anymore, but rather one of the best enemies in the game. Possibly even the best enemy in the game, though I can't decide whether that award goes to the Black Knights, the Silver Knights or these spooky guys here, the Dark Wraiths. Such an awesome moveset, throwing out some attacks which have an unexpected grace when you consider their deathly appearance, though their dance of combos and thrusts will occasionally be interrupted by a humanity stealing grab attack from their dark hand, which you might even get as a drop if you're extremely lucky. There are some dark, grimy and moody levels from these games that just don't really do it for me. A perfect example is the subterranean shunning grounds from Elden Ring, which I've never been able to enjoy, though plenty of people love it. But in other cases, these sorts of levels hit just the right spot for me, bringing to the table an outstanding combination of atmosphere, dark ambience, satisfying level design and great enemy encounters. And a perfect example of such a level is New Londo Ruins, which over the years I've grown to greatly appreciate and enjoy. Wasn't all that long ago that I talked about Dark Souls 2's Dragon Shrine, a grand set of structures dedicated to the worship and protection of the ancient dragon resting upon its highest point, but the level lying directly before the shrine and directly after Aldia's Keep is the Dragon Eyrie, a far wilder level with far more dragons. Throughout my big list, I've given Dark Souls 2 an awful lot of, frankly, well-deserved flack for the way many of its levels look, but I'll also be the first to praise it for when it pulls a 180 with some stunning level you never saw coming, which is exactly what happens when you first ascend to the Dragon Eyrie. In a way, the Dragon Eyrie is kind of like a less chaotic version of Crumbling Faram Azula with how fragmented its landscape is, not to mention the constant presence of dragons flying overhead. There's really not any sort of conventional layout to the Dragon Eyrie, but rather it's a collection of stone platforms and peaks connected by rickety bridges and rope slides, though also guarded by rupturing hollows and red dragons. Regarding these hollows, I remember initially being confused by them because even though I was caught directly in the blast when one exploded on me, it did exactly zero damage. And so I thought the game had bugged or something, but then I got hit again, only for half of my fucking armour and rings to break because some of these guys specifically do corrosive damage. Fun times. They're hardly the most engaging enemy in the game, more being something to nimbly avoid before quickly dispatching them with a single hit, but the red dragons are way more enjoyable to fight. They have a pretty limited moveset, but it's a fun moveset to fight against as you stack the damage higher, perhaps with a pair of power stance weapons while dodging its bites, stomps and the occasional blast of its fire breath. The Dragon Eyrie is also one of the best places for accumulating lots of rare ores and titanite, which just adds to the enjoyment of moving through this bright, high altitude home for dragons. As with some other levels I've discussed, layout wise the Dragon Eyrie really isn't even close to being the best of the bunch, but the heavy dragon theme and incredible visuals make it a pleasure to move through anyway, right up to the wobbly bridge at the end where you can even get insta-killed if you linger on it for too long. Say what you want about Dark Souls 2, but this shit is awesome. And now we come to the other level of the Tower of Latria. Upper Latria didn't score badly at all at number 53, but before all that perilous traversal over high walkways and through gargoyles and other unspeakable abominations, you have to make your way through the lower level, the Prison of Hope. I think it's fair to say that the Prison of Hope is the most complex level in Demon Souls, though rather than the complexity coming from some expansive, unconventional environment, the level itself really isn't all that massive, and furthermore, in a sense, it's very conventional, and even orderly. Most of the prison is in fact laid out like a prison, with rows of cells and multiple different levels. The issue is that most of these cells are locked, and thus the gist of the level is to explore as much as you can until you get a new key, at which point you can go back to earlier cells which were locked before and pass through them, allowing for further exploration and progression through the level until it's pretty much all accessible to you. Though even if you do explore thoroughly, you might still be left scratching your head at some sections which require world tendency manipulation to figure out. The thing that makes the level so challenging to navigate is the sheer number of cells and floors, and how similar so much of it looks. Though rather than me deducting points for this, as I might do in other cases, I will allow it here, because it's a prison. It's supposed to look and feel like a prison, and as such, it shouldn't be fanciful and super varied, so no points deducted in this case. There's not actually a point system by the way, I'm literally just talking out my arse, as usual. 
Mind you, the level does change it up somewhat from around the halfway point onwards when you leave the main prison area and have to contend with the goddess statue and its deadly arrow volleys. Pretty terrifying, weird sight the first time you see it, and while the idea is that you find an alternate route around so as to deactivate it, it's entirely possible to just time your dodge rolls correctly and skip all that. But of course, I'm forgetting something, aren't I? I'm forgetting a certain other harmful element present throughout the level, and those are the mind flares. There's really not all that much enemy variety in this level, and in fact, most of who you encounter are maddened, draggling prisoners who are only really dangerous when in groups. The real menace of the prison though are these octopus-headed horrors, who are like an even more deadly combination of the brain suckers from Bloodborne and the jailers from Dark Souls 3. Honestly, I fucking hate fighting these things. With most Souls enemies, I'm usually happy to engage them in combat, and by that I mean I accept that there will be a trade of blows, though ideally I will successfully dodge all theirs, thus getting in plenty of my own so that I win. But for the Mind Flayers, my sole goal is to get in there and flatten them before they even have a chance to flatten me with a paralysis projectile or their AoE attack. Brutal enemy who truly does make me fearful when I hear them nearby. If I didn't have such a sick love of castles and stuff, I might just have considered the Prison of Hope to be my number one favourite Demon Souls level, but alas, Boletaria exists and my heart belongs to it. At the end of Dark Souls 3, after the remains of all five Lords of Cinders have been placed on their thrones, the player can warp to an alternate version of Firelink Shrine in a location called the Dreadkeep, which acts as the arena for the final fight with the Soul of Cinder, but then the Ring City DLC dropped and fleshed the Dreadkeep out into a fully explorable level with its own range of dark and formidable new enemies. As you've heard several times throughout this series of mine, I'm very much partial to a spectacular view, to bright, splendiferous scenes of beauty and colour, but on the other hand, I can be just as enthusiastic about dark scenes of overwhelming apocalyptic devastation, which is exactly what greets the player when they first step out into the drag heap. Truly an awe-inspiring view, and the old crone here is one of my all-time favourite Soulsborn NPCs. Her dialogue and voice acting are absolutely superb, and she gets extra points from me for sounding like an old cat. I love cats. Furthermore, the fact that she later metamorphizes into an angel just adds to what a great character she is. Brilliant start to a brilliant level. The Dreadkeep does something I normally don't enjoy too much, by flooding many parts of the level with weaker enemies, specifically the Murkmans. Murkmen some of whom will grab at you while others send humanity sprite projectiles your way, and it can make getting through the level feel very frantic, and furthermore, unless I'm mistaken, these things seem to infinitely respawn at some sections, meaning you are heavily incentivized to run the fuck past stuff. It's not just the Murkmen who do this though, I don't want to lay the blame entirely at the murky hands of the Murkmen, because the single most terrifying and dangerous foe of the Dreg Heap is the aforementioned Angels. Screaming monstrosities that kind of look and sound like the Orphan of Cause if it had wings, which again is pretty terrifying. All you can do when one of these is in the area is try your best to evade it and find cover from its relentless barrages of holy lasers. They'll take cover for too long and it will bathe the area in a feathery white light, causing AoE curse buildup. In my recent Blasphemous 2 video that almost no one watched, I discussed how there was something inherently fascinating and compelling with taking a concept which is normally considered pure and benevolent and imbuing it with malevolence, or making something look bright and beautiful but just beneath the surface lurks immense cruelty and decay. It's something Elden Ring does extremely well on multiple occasions, but Dark Souls 3 does it too here, with how it fucks with your idea of an angel, dispensing with what you'd think an angel would look like and replacing it with the shrieking terror. It plays with this same sort of idea with the Winged Knights earlier on in the game, which are also clearly supposed to resemble angels, and who also have heavenly attacks like Divine Pillars of Light, while also looking pretty terrifying and cruel. Anyway, for as much as they might force me to scurry and hide to avoid certain death throughout the level, I really like the angels. And I like them even more when you take into account that if you find their corresponding pilgrim, you can permanently put them down and make the dreck heap that little bit safer for everyone. There are plenty of other things to harm you here though. For a start, there's another massive poison swamp, which can be a bit of a slog to move through, though great treasures also abound here, like the Ring of Favour and Protection plus 3. 
The Ring City was a bit weird when it came to the rings, because if you played Dark Souls 3 on New Game Plus, then the Plus 1 versions of rings are added to the game at different points throughout the game world, and then you can get the Plus 2 versions on New Game Plus 2, but then the Ring City came out and let you get Plus 3 versions of rings even if you were on your first New Game Cycle. Bit weird, but hey, I shouldn't complain too loudly about getting my hands on some of the game's strongest rings. Another new inclusion of the Dreadkeep which really elevates it for me is the Harrow Legion Knights, prowling around at various points throughout the level. You see them again in the actual Ring City in even greater number, but I about shit myself when I first saw and heard one noisily clanging away at the top of these stairs, but they make for just another one of Dark Souls 3's many, many brilliant enemies, having long, wild combos and lots of health, though you can absolutely trivialise them if you manage to land a plunging attack. In case you haven't figured it out yet, I love Dark Souls 3, and I've played through it many, many a time, but my enjoyment of the game around the Undead Settlement Road of Sacrifices portion does tend to sag a bit. Those aren't bad levels or anything, but they just don't excite me all that much. At the end of the Road of Sacrifices though, the Chapel of the Deep comes into view, and from this point on my enjoyment ramps right back up, because this whole level is awesome, even if Gale here does kind of ruin the mood. You can't actually enter the cathedral from here yet though, and so the only way forward is through the cemetery, and while this isn't necessarily the most enjoyable section of the game to play through, atmospherically speaking, it's pretty much peak Dark Souls 3. There's such an overwhelming tone of death and decay here, with emaciated corpses pushing themselves out of the ground to try and grab you and vomit at you, and then there's the infested variants who are swarming with leeches. But Rather than the skybox being black with the dominant colour palette being dark and gloomy, everything is scorchingly bright, which, if anything, just adds to the thick aura of decay, this legion of rotting hollows baking and burning under the sun, an idea beautifully illustrated by the lone, non-aggressive hollow standing on the path here, staring straight out into the horizon. I know I haven't even started talking about the actual cathedral itself yet, but this cemetery section leading up to it is superbly done, and desolate scenes like this are a major reason why I consider Dark Souls 3 to be such a special game. It really is quite a fucking trial to actually infiltrate into the cathedral though, even requiring a bit of platforming as well as contending against an army of thralls, deacons and grave wardens, though if you befriended the kindly giant archer then he can lend a few helping arrows here. Sick. For as much as I praised the run up to the cathedral though, that moment when you step inside and behold it all is magnificent, with the sight of this thick layer of sludge covering the ground and the despondent giant hunched over within the mire. This is the kind of shit I love in a level, pun not intended, though traversing through it doesn't feel quite so enjoyable. There are more evangelists hiding around, though sadly a lot of thralls too which aren't quite as enjoyable or interesting to fight, but the Cathedral of the Deep introduces one of the game's sickest enemies, with the Cathedral Knights. Super intimidating enemy with one of the all time sickest Soulsborn armour sets, it's top 10 for sure, maybe even in the top 5 for Pete's sake. They can be really difficult to beat, but are always great fun too, both the giant mace and cathedral greatsword variants, though the rafter part leading to Rosaria's chambers gets a bit ridiculous. Honestly, the Cathedral of the Deep had the potential to be a top 10 level, but for as much as I enjoyed the layer of sludge thematically, it's a real literal slog to actually move through. I don't really enjoy having to spam fat rolls just to move from A to B, and furthermore, I also don't like how shortcut focused the level is. I know that sounds silly, but they tried too hard to make it all loop back to the Chapel of the Deep via lifts and locked doors and stuff, and it makes it all feel quite unintuitive and illogical to move through. I think the level would have felt much better if they just added another bonfire. Even so, I'm not trying to poo poo the Cathedral of the Night over much here, it's awesome. For number 23, we are back in Boletaria to its second level, the Lord's Path. Now, Soulsborn levels may vary widely in complexity, but I am absolutely not of the opinion that great complexity automatically equates to a more enjoyable experience. And in fact, if a level is too much of a pain to navigate through, it can even harm the experience. And by that same token, just because the level's layout is very simple, doesn't mean that it's lame or unengaging to play through which is where the Lord's Path comes in, because the idea here is simply to move forward over or through a bridge. 
Of course, things aren't quite as simple as all that, because there happens to be a ferocious red dragon, burning any and all objects and life forms found on the bridge to a crisp, and therein lies the issue. For the first bridge, it's simply a matter of timing it properly so as to make it to the other side before the flames get you. But for the second, it's impossible to run fast enough, the tower's just too far away, and so you've got to move through the tunnel and then out the other end, again making a Stravis acquaintance along the way, not to mention that horrible, horrible section with the too many dogs. There's really not a massive amount to say about the Lord's Path, because it's just not a big or complex level, but the idea and execution of the dragon is superbly done, and as such I love moving through it, and it feels great when you manage to reach the far end, past the archers and blue eyed knights and on through the fog wall. Of course there is always the option of taking down the red dragon, which sounds awesome, but absolutely isn't. In fact, it kind of fucking sucks, and took me about 10 minutes at least with this method. I imagine there must be faster ways. Still. It feels very rewarding being able to just cross the whole bridge unscathed now and collect all the amazing items like the spiked shield and renowned hero's soul. Wow. Number 22 in my list is actually the fourth level so far from Dark Souls 2's Crown of the Sunken King DLC, but by far the best. It's Shulva Sanctum City. Lots of folk talk about the superior quality and level design found in Dark Souls 2's DLCs when compared to most of its base game levels, and indeed it very quickly becomes obvious that you're dealing with something pretty special when you first enter Shulva, as the distant dragon sanctum comes into view before the camouflaged sin slumbering dragon comes to life and flies off into the distance. Don't you just love a good dragon intro? Each of the three DLCs has its own dominant theme or element which persists throughout its levels and which even the very enemies are imbued with in addition to the environment, and for Shulva, that element is poison. The enemies cause poison buildup with their attacks, there are moving statues who spit out poison, and even the main boss of the DLC, Sin, uses poison, or rather toxic, with its attacks, though thankfully, somehow, there are no poison swamps to be found anywhere in this DLC. Enemies aside for a second, the main level mechanic in Shulva is the presence of mechanisms which can be activated to alter the landscape of the city, so as to make it more navigable, some things drastically. Some of these mechanisms are in clear view, whilst others are a bit more hidden, perhaps helping to deal some damage to a group of enemies, while in other cases, they'll allow passage to some hidden section of the level for more sweet loot. In one particularly excellent, though somewhat easily missable case though, you can even raise a series of platforms to reveal the path to a hidden bonfire, and if that's not a brilliant feature for a level, then my full legal name isn't Candle Type 1A. Shulva ticks most of the right boxes that a great level needs, though perhaps the one area where it falls a bit short is in its enemies. The Sanctum soldiers are decent enough, but that's about all they are, and furthermore they are nearly exclusively what you'll be fighting throughout the whole level. Shulva is also at a wee bit of a disadvantage when compared to Broom Tower and Alien Voice in that the Crown of the Sunken King DLC is also broken up into the Dragon Sanctum and Dragon's Rest coming, though let's not mention the Cave of the Dead again while Alien Voice and Broom Tower are far less broken up, feeling more like enormous levels to explore, though let's not mention the frigid outskirts, the Iron Passage or the memory of the old Iron King again. And following on from that we have another DLC area, this time from the crown of the Ivory King, it's Frozen Alien Voice. As with all the DLCs, Alien Voice makes a superb, superb, superb presentation, with its dominant element of course being one of ice, yeah no shit. Much of the large, lost city is either blanketed under snow or encased in ice, including actual parts of the level, a number of treasure chests and even a ferrous lockstone contraption. This does of course all tie into the main level mechanic, because Alien Voice essentially has two versions, the frozen version and then the shattered version which initiates upon speaking to Queen Alsana in the Grand Cathedral, allowing other sections of the level to be accessed. I also can't forget the Eye of the Priestess which, although technically optional, I think, also plays an important and interesting role, rendering some enemies fully visible and a ladder, though you can still climb up it in its invisible state, it just looks a bit strange. More importantly though, the Eye of the Priestess is required to make Ava fully visible which, although seeming like a basic requirement for its defeat for most people, isn't technically needed to take it down. No thanks though, I'll go for the version of it where I can, you know, see what it's doing, please. I really can't overstate how much I love the ice shattering aspect of the level though. 
At this point I've praised a number of levels for featuring mechanisms or some such at or near the end of the level which enable earlier previously blocked off parts to be fully explored and yeah, Alien Lois really is the king when it comes to that sort of thing. It's such a big level too, especially if you choose to seek out the three Lois Knights to help out in the final fight with the burnt Ivory King which, although optional, helps massively with that boss and also gives you a good reason to explore even more of the city which is of course well worth doing. As far as the enemy variety of the DLC goes, well it's certainly more varied than Shulva's Sanctum City who I just discussed, but again, for the most part you will be fighting the kind of generic Rampart soldiers, which are fine I guess, but nothing all that exciting. The Rampart Golems are way more badass though, and a really cool aspect to the entire level is that after the ice is shattered, all the previously non-hostile retainers start coming after you. Not unlike how the Hyde Knights and the Tower of Flame do after beating the Dragon Rider, except in Alien Lois, things feel a bit more finely tuned. That said, fuck these dumb hedgehog things, they are basically Dark Souls 2's answer to the Bone Wheels, and I don't like them. And the less said about Maldron the Assassin, the better. Let's finish up the trilogy of main Dark Souls 2 DLC levels with Broom Tower from the Crown of the Iron King DLC, which I've put just ahead of Shulva and Frozen Alien Lois, but just by the tiniest little bit, because I really do consider all three levels to be so bloody perp, absolutely. As if indeed pointed out, the dominant feature of Broom Tower is fire. Of course, we already had a heavily fire themed level with the Iron Keep, where you even fight the titular Old Iron King of the DLC, but Broom Tower feels very different from that level and with its own mechanics, not to mention being far larger and certainly more difficult. Just as Shulva had its terrain manipulation and Alien Lois had its level transformation, this level has the grotesque idols of Nedalia, Pride of Ash. One of these bizarre looking things emerges up from the ash very early on in the level, though thankfully you have already picked up a bunch of nearby smelter wedges to destroy it, yielding a portion of its soul. You might not have much of an idea of what on earth these things are at this point, but essentially there are a number of them located throughout Broom Tower who make shit harder, and in different ways too. The most common way is by encasing all nearby enemies in ash, giving them a substantial buff to damage, defence and even poise from what I can tell. The regular soldier enemies are already dangerous as hell here, especially when there's a number of them at a time, which there often is, but you really don't want to fuck with a buffed up smelter giant, which, if I may be so bold as to say so, might be one of FromSoft's most badass enemy designs. These things are so sick and intimidating, and I also love how there are two variants of them, the one with the giant mace and the one with the smelter hammer, which, as far as I know, is the largest and heaviest weapon in Dark Souls 2, and as such, has a strength requirement of 70. Now that's what I call a chicken drumstick. I got off track though, because I was talking about the Nadalia idols. As well as the enemy buffs, they can also sustain a constant miasma of curse within a particular area, and in the case of the Fume Knight boss arena, who I consider to be the single greatest boss in the game, they can even heal him if he's within their AoE. Thus, you are heavily incentivized to seek out every smelter wedge throughout Broom Tower and dispose of every idol. And just like with the level mechanics of the other two DLCs I've discussed, I bloody love this. The idols make the level significantly harder, and that alone heavily incentivizes you to seek them all out, not to mention that after destroying all 12, you get the complete soul of Nadalia. It's like a collectathon, a collectathon of fire and ash. Sorry, sorry to get dramatic there. Enemies aside though, the layout of the level is also outlandish as hell. It's not a case where you can see all these massive machinations and structures, but don't actually get to explore them either. You do get to go to these places here, across giant chains and up elevators, and then down into dark ashy depths defended by possessed armors, fume sorcerers and ashen crawlers, whose design really reminds me of the suppressors from the suffering ties that bind. Random reference, I know, but yeah, there it is. Baldron the Assassin also makes a return after his utterly shocking behaviour in Alien Voice. I'll tell you your behaviour last night was shocking, eh? Fucking voice, man. Shocking! So they made him even more of an insufferable prick here by having him run down into the nearby curse-filled area which happens to be heaving with buffed up enemies. I was trying to find a clip where I managed to kill Maldron down here, but I couldn't. I think I literally just gave up on my last playthrough. And no bloody wonder. Fuck you, Maldron. And at number 19 in a placement which may very well raise a few eyebrows, but I don't give a fuck, it's Hyde's Tower of Flame, which is my favourite level in Dark Souls 2. Is it the best level in Dark Souls 2? No. 
but is it my favourite level in Dark Souls 2? Yes, which is why it's here. You can point to the majesty of the Dragon Eyrie, or the excellent level mechanics found in the main DLC levels, or any other excellent collection of aspects found in any other level from Dark Souls 2. And I'll say, yeah, that stuff's great, but I love Hyde's Tower of Flame, or at least the vanilla version of it, before they fucked it up a bit in Scholar of the First Sin. Nostalgia is definitely a part of why I like the level 2, though I must admit, a lot of people hated Dark Souls 2 when it first came out, and honestly, my own feelings on the game have soured to some degree through the years, but I absolutely loved this game when it first came out, and while I was enchanted by the sights, sounds and characters of Majula, my arrival into the Tower of Flame was when I was truly sold. Absolutely one of the most beautiful, magical levels of any Soulsborne game. It just looks so bloody nice. Of course, a significant portion of what you're seeing is inaccessible, all those distant ruins, not to mention the shimmering sea, but even so, I love the way everything looks here. And as for the actual level layout, well, I love that too, and the enemies found throughout. Like some other high-ranking levels in my list, Hyde's Tower of Flame really isn't a very complex level, and nor is it particularly lengthy, but what's here simply both looks and feels hugely enjoyable. It can be pretty damn rough if you choose to come here first instead of the Forest of Fallen Giants, because these old knights sure as hell aren't pushovers, and you've also got the water hazards to watch out for if you're rolling around too recklessly, but the mechanic where a switch pops out of the ground after defeating the enemy at that section is just great, making the level increasingly accessible and even slightly lowering the difficulty of the Dragon Rider boss fight by increasing the circumference of the arena. As for the score of the first Sin version, well I'm not quite so praiseworthy. Now you've got a lot of Hyde Knights sitting around in places, and while they're not hostile to start with, after beating the Dragon Rider boss they'll all start moving and converging upon your location, and that can be a big problem when you're also trying to fight multiple old knights. I guess you could just say, alright, I'll take out the old Dragon Slayer first, and then just book it to the Dragon Rider Fogwall afterwards, past the frankly excessive number of enemies, but for Scholar, they went and put a red dragon on the platform leading to the old Dragon Slayer Fogwall, which I absolutely hate. Brilliant enemy, I love the red dragon, but I don't love them here. If you're using a bow, it's fine, but if not, fuck you and good luck, I guess, especially if you screwed up your chance at making it across to begin with, and now the dragon's spamming its fire breath attack. Ugh, look at me, this is supposed to be one of my all-time favourite levels, and here I am lambasting it. But bear in mind, it's the scholar of the first scent I have issues with, not the vanilla version, and even with the scholar version, I still love it despite its flaws. I truly love Dark Souls Undead Bark for many reasons, which I will soon get into when I get to it a bit further down the list, but located directly after the Undead Bark, past the fearsome Hellkite Drake, is the Undead Parish. A fairly small level, but one which I adore, because simply and crudely put, it crams a lot of good shit into a short but really nice looking environment. For a start, you've got another Black Knight here, and one which is fiendishly, but at the same time wonderfully positioned at the top of this tower. When you're first climbing up these spiral stairs, you don't know what's on top, whether there's going to be some treasure or maybe a hollow archer, but what's really waiting, ominously and threateningly up there, is the most badass Black Knight variant of them all, the Great Sword Wielding One. Parrying these guys feels that bit more terrifying compared to the Straight Sword Wielding Cousins. And then just ahead you've got the Fang Boar, which is nearly guaranteed to flatten any Dark Souls noob, though in truth it's really not difficult once you figure it out. You can deal massive damage with a plunge attack from the ledge, circle around it for a backstab, or if you're feeling extra cheeky, simply lure it into the fire with an alluring skull. It works surprisingly well. Oh, but that's not all. Uh, sorry, I don't know why I'm talking like that. Because just ahead you've got the church with the three Balder Knights who can pose a merciless challenge if you're not all that familiar with their movesets, especially if you don't yet know how to counter the automatic parry move of the one with the Balder side sword. But then ahead of these guys, you have one of the game's three Berenique Knights, clad in steel armour and armed with a supersized mace and tower shield. I know I say this a lot, but again, for as few of them as there are throughout Lord Ran, one of the coolest enemies in the game. Big and heavy, and so strong that they shake the ground with their attacks, which is the way I like it. Pound me, daddy. But then even after that, you've got an encounter with the first channeler, shooting powerful soul magic from the balcony and providing serious buffs to the army of hollows surrounding him. Like I said, the Undead Parish really isn't a large level at all, but a level doesn't have to be large for me to love playing through it. 
and I really love playing through the Undead Parish and its sequence of memorable and enjoyable encounters. And also, there's a shortcut to Firelink Shrine, that's great too. And for number 17, and what I consider to be the second best level in Demon Souls, I choose the Gates of Boletaria. The first proper level in the game and one which must be beaten before any other archstone can be accessed, and before you can even level up. I don't have the Gates of Boletaria here because it's the most dangerous and atmospheric level in the game, because it's not, but because not only is it nearly perfect as a starting level, but it's pretty much top tier as a level full stop. Everyone remembers the Dark Souls moment when you first see the Hellkite Drake at the start of the Undead Bark, but Demon Souls did it first, also with a Red Dragon and one you can encounter later on in the level too, although you can make both it and its blue brother totally disappear from this section if you achieve pure white world tendency, but let's not get into the whole world tendency discussion, please. Most of the enemies are simple dreglings with very basic attack patterns, but even so they can absolutely mess you up if you get complacent, though the blue-eyed knights present far more of a challenge while still being great fun to fight, and to try out a parry or two, though any time I've gone after the lone red-eyed knight guarding the mausoleum housing old King Doran, it seldom goes my way, but regardless, I always appreciate the inclusion of an extra powerful optional enemy if you've got the skills for it, and this is something FromSoft do a lot to great effect. Layout wise, the level does an excellent job of introducing those familiar, satisfying Soulsborne level features like shortcuts and mechanisms located later on in the level to open up an earlier section. And although the aforementioned Lord's Path level back at number 23 entirely revolved around evading the Prowling Dragon Demon along the bridge, a mini version of that section and what is essentially an earlier version of the Undead Burg's Hellkite encounter also appears at the end of this level, and it's just great. I love it. Another element of the Gates of Boletaria that I've always really appreciated is how frequently the enemies drop firebombs and turpentine, oh pardon me, pine resin, and how well they certainly come in handy for dealing with the regular enemies, such as the blood crazed reglings, being for poor Ostrava's blood, they really come into play in countering the level boss. I know the Phalanx is hardly a super challenging encounter, but I've always appreciated how the game sprinkles these consumables upon you throughout the level. It all feels very logical and satisfying. The Gates of Boletaria is a terrific level which makes for an excellent start to a great game, though there is one other Boletaria level that I consider to be even better than this one, soon to be discussed. One of my favourite aspects of Dark Souls 1's painted world of Ariamis isn't just the level itself, but also the steps required to actually get into the level. Got to quite literally fly by bird back to the Undead Asylum, nail the stray demon, then grab the peculiar doll, after which the enormous painting in the large hall at Anor Londo can be interacted with, pulling you into a completely different level which cannot be exited from until you reach the end. So best make sure you're well prepared before you enter, because this sure as hell ain't some simple tacked on wee extra level. This is the painted world of Ariamis. I've heard through the years that this was actually one of, if not the first level that FromSoft designed for Dark Souls 1, and while I'm not sure whether that's true or not, the fact remains that the Painted World is a very impressive and ambitious level, and in fact I'd say it's by far the densest level in the game. That's not to say that it's small and dense though, because while it's not the largest level in the game, it's still a very respectable size. But within the level lie so many secrets, treasures, tucked away areas and interesting formidable enemies that even traversing through a small portion of it can feel more stimulating than moving through some entire other levels of the game. Difficulty wise, the Painted World isn't quite up there with the game's most challenging levels, but it's still not to be trifled with. One of the most common enemies here are Hollows, who hardly make for the most interesting or impressive foes in the game, but even so, they can still mess you up if there's enough of them, and the Engorged Hollows in particular can easily ruin a run through the place if they catch you out with a post-mortem toxic mist. There's also the Crow Demons, an enemy any Platinum Trophy Hunter will be well acquainted with, gotta love that 6% souvenir of reprisal drop rate. Sadly, the Bone Wheels are back in a big way, guarding the mechanism down the well required to open the way to the Priscilla boss fight, and really, if anything, they suck even more here than they did in the catacombs, because now they can suddenly come spinning through an illusory wall and make a bloody national laughing stock of your health bar. My favourite wee portion of the Painted World, however, is the part where King Jeremiah invades. 
As a Phantom, he's pretty cool, sporting the outlandish yet undeniably stylish Xanthus set, but something I only noticed on my most recent playthrough of the game is that there's an insanely creepy aural ambience here that's really unnerving, complemented both effectively and morbidly by the crude collection of tall spikes sporting impaled corpses from which perched crows loudly caw. Truly an outstanding level, not only from Dark Souls 1 but from the entire trilogy. Not only is it a masterclass in dense, intricate level design, but it's also filled with excellent and memorable enemy encounters, and also the bone wheels. After the absolutely excellent level that is Central Yarnum and then the bloody fantastic boss that is Father Gascoigne, you pass through the wooden doors to Odin Chapel, the home of the creepy but surprisingly kindly chapel dweller, beyond which lies the sprawling architecture and alleys of Cathedral Ward. Even before exiting out amongst the cathedrals though, Odin Chapel itself is such a fantastic wee area, being the closest thing that the game has to a secondary hub area. On my early playthroughs, I totally missed out on all the super interesting characters you could meet out in Yarnum and send here like Ariana, the Skeptical Man, Grandma and Adela the Nun, though we don't like to talk about the suspicious beggar around here. The dialogue and personalities of these characters are literally some of the most entertaining, interesting and superbly voice acted out of any FromSoft game and that's really saying something. Whereas Central Yarnum was primarily home to beasts, boars and trolls on the hunt for outsiders, the inhabitants of Cathedral Ward tend to be more strange and pale than beastly, like their grotesque chapel giants and the prowling slender church servants, and with canes, lanterns or crucifixes. The shift in enemy type instantly gives the level a very different character to the one just before it, though if anything Cathedral Ward seems even larger and more complex. In fact, despite myself I still sometimes get lost in here. It's not badly laid out or anything, but I can never remember exactly how to get to the Forbidden Woods from here, and sometimes I'll even have to refresh myself on how to get around the main gate into the central chapel giant area without having to shell out 10k blood echoes for the Hunter Chief's emblem. Every moment and every scene in Cathedral Ward feels memorable and filled with flavour, from the creepier, smokier sections down below amidst the cramped alleys where beasts and riflemen lurk, obscured by the thick haze, to the middle portion with the chapel giants and flame-spraying church servants with their amusing floppy hats, and then finally the ascent of the long stairs to the Grand Cathedral, past more weird enemies like the frenzy-inflicting crucifix guys at the top of the stairs, which will most likely be most players' first encounter with Frenzy 2, instilling panic, as the meter grows and grows and you think, hey, don't know what the status effect is, but maybe it won't be so bad, and oops, there goes literally 70% of my max HP. Fuck. The second I exited out of the Undead Parish and saw those large iron gates to Sen's fortress, I could not wait to see what was inside. Based on what I'd already experienced in the game up until that point, I knew whatever it was was probably going to kick my arse into next Wednesday, but nonetheless, my curiosity was thoroughly piqued. Though of course, it wasn't until I rang the second bell of awakening down in Quellag's domain that the gate opened up, in a cutscene that managed to be really hype, whilst also being rather chilled. I mean, it's just a gate being opened up. But not just any gate, no. The Gate to Sen's Fortress, a dark, intricate, multi-floored dungeon filled to the brim with man-serpents, powerful monsters and deadly traps, ready to mercilessly destroy the unwary player. Ambushed by foul invention. Although the design of the man-serpents is admittedly rather tacky, especially when compared with the calibre of most of Dark Souls 1's other enemy designs, I've always loved actually fighting them. They're slow but powerful which makes them ideal enemies for busting out the parries which are always fun to pull off. The place is lousy with these things, but the traps, Jerry, it's all about the traps. You'll find no calm, gentle terrain here, featuring straightforward paths to the end of the level, but instead the environment is designed to kill you, featuring super narrow walkways, swinging pendulums, massive boulders and arrow traps, some of which are very fiendishly placed. And let's not forget the cruel placement of some projectile hurling enemies to make it all that bit more difficult, and at times brutal. Every Dark Souls veteran has at least one time experienced the triumph of making it to near the top of the fortress before making a single misstep and falling all the way down to the dark demon pits below, to their death. Or perhaps you even survive the fall, great, except now you've got to find your way out of this dark hellhole 
with its four, yes, four Titanite demons. Shit's rough. Things do get a bit brighter at the top though, at least temporarily. After emerging out of the main dungeon, the Man Serpents are instead replaced by an even better enemy, more Balder Knights, complemented wonderfully by periodic bursts of fire from the bomb chucking troll yonder that way to make navigating around the place that bit more difficult. One of the fantastic things about Sense Fortress is that for as dark, oppressive and difficult as it often is in places and for how intentionally confusing it can be to navigate around the mid portion, it always feels really, really fun. Swinging pendulums are awesome, and a bomb throwing troll, bring it on. It's a place I don't massively mind dying in, because that's just part of the Sens experience. The experience of one of the greatest levels in Dark Souls 1, and a level which leads directly onto what is, in my opinion, an even greater level. Just a few entries ago we had the Painted World from Dark Souls 1, which scored exceedingly highly on my list. But with the release of Dark Souls 3's first DLC, Ashes of Ariandel, a new such world was introduced, that being the painted world of Ariandel. When this DLC first came out I didn't immediately pick it up, not because I was apprehensive or anything but because I was probably busy with other stuff, I don't remember. But what I do remember is seeing people online complaining about the DLC, with their main complaint being that it was way shorter than they expected. Well, I personally never saw any issue with its length. And anyway, size doesn't matter, it's what you do with it that counts. Right? Of course, the Painted World isn't the first snowy level in the Dark Souls trilogy. The original Painted World had some snow in it, and Frozen Elaine Lois was a damn winter wonderland, but this level really doesn't feel very similar to any other Dark Souls level before it. For a start, despite the complaints about its length, this is a massive level, boasting some very wide open sections, making it truly feel like you're exploring the heights of some distant frigid mountain. Lots of great new enemy types here too to help push that feeling like the followers throwing spears from the snowy mist and the perhaps most notably of all, there are proper packs of wolves that come after you in the next section with impressively wolf-like behaviour. It's very realistic, at least until the 13 foot tall one shows up. It's the painted world's open, mountainous terrain that makes it feel so distinctive and enjoyable to move through, because apart from the Corvian settlement near the chapel, most of it feels very untamed really adding to the feeling of exploration and making it feel very different compared to levels like the Catacombs of Carthus, the High Wall and even Erythil as you climb down branches, traverse across frozen lakes and move along cliffs while being harangued by fire-breathing followers. Most of this level looks gorgeous, but not only does it look good, but it plays good too. Some excellent Soulsborne levels really are made such by the excellent enemies found within them, but the Painted World has both things going for it, both its layout and the enemies. I'm a castle man and a brooachman. Mimi, I'm a handsome man and a brooachman. Mimi wants a brooch. But I also love a sick enemy, powerful knights or warriors with mighty weapons and armour, and the Painted World delivers fully in that respect with the Melwood Knights. The first time I turned into this area with the ruins and towers, to see that first Millwood Knight stalking around was magnificent, such a sick enemy and truly intimidating to fight. The game sure as hell isn't shy about throwing several of these guys at you at once, not to mention the one constantly shooting down AoE attack causing arrows from the tower here. And then later on, you have one with a weapon strong enough to shake the very earth under your feet as you're fighting for your life against other knights. There's another very different type of knight found in the level 2 though, residing in and around the Corvian settlement. Taloned fiends which could have been taken straight out of Bloodborne, not only their design but also their quick, fierce combos. Although they're smaller, these things are even more intimidating and dangerous than the Millwood Knights, and further on through the settlement you even see one of Dark Souls 3's very rare cases of friendly fire, as one slaughters a group of fleeing Corvian settlers. Brilliant DLC with a brilliant inspired level design, and for as much as I do love Dark Souls 3's base game, I always appreciate how they didn't just make this DLC feel like more of the same, and as a result, exploring the painted world always feels distinctly refreshing. Let's take a step back from Dark Souls 3's DLC though and return to its first proper level after the Cemetery of Ash, to the High Wall of Lothric. As far as the tutorial levels in these games go, sure, it's important to make them, well, good, but at the same time, they don't need to be the flashiest, most exciting levels in the game, because their purpose is effectively to serve as introductions to the game to let you get a feel for the movement, the combat, the story, etc. 
As for an opening level though, the thing that comes after the tutorial, well, that absolutely does need to be extra good, and yes, even a bit flashy, because the introductions are done, so let's bloody well get on with it please. It just so happens that FromSoft happen to be excellent at designing and presenting outstanding opening levels, hence why several of them are placed very highly in my list, but one of my absolute favourites is the High Wall of Lothric, the first level you warp to from Firelink Shrine. Although the actual Lothric Castle is located a bit higher up in the game world and only accessible later on, unless you want to take your chances with the Dancer of the Boreal Valley early on, which I personally do not, the environment of the High Wall of Lothric still feels very castle-like, with an absolute army of soldiers and imposing Lothric knights. Of course, with this being Dark Souls 3, everything is completely fucked here. All the soldiers are hollowed and there are dead bodies everywhere, even dragon corpses, so there is also a live dragon at one spot, indiscriminately roasting any living thing in its path. The High Wall does a great job at establishing the mood of intense desolation that pervades through nearly every Dark Souls 3 level, but it achieves this while also making the level really enjoyable to move through, whilst looking fantastic too, in a sort of very grim way. Although it's kind of linear, in the sense that there's just one entrance and one feasible exit, at least in the early game, moving through it doesn't feel linear at all. In fact, there are multiple ways to get through the level, depending on if you're bold enough to brave the dragon fire here, or if you want to pass through the prowling wigan knights, or just face it directly. And of course, there are a few shortcuts to make the whole experience of moving through it that bit more gratifying and satisfying. And you will need those shortcuts too, because this is not an easy level. There are a lot of enemies here, and many of them are tough as nails. I remember dying a bunch to the very first Lothric knight you encounter after the stairs with the dragon fire, and if you're feeling extra bold a bit later on in the level, you can even take on the extra tough red-eyed Lothric knight. It's very similar to the red-eyed knight tucked away in a corner of Demon Souls' first level. Absolutely superb opening level, and this place is a big reason why I always look forward to starting any fresh Dark Souls 3 playthrough. And as for Lothric Castle, which lies just above it, well, we will get to that soon. The region of Leonia is absolutely massive. I haven't done the math, but from what I can tell, it's by far the largest region in the game, but also the most magical. Some of the views here are downright stunning, especially with the effect of the thick pale mists that cover much of its surface, particularly over the large central lake section. But within that lake is a particularly striking landmark, standing tall and imposing and contributing massively to the region's mystical atmosphere. It's Rhea Lucaria Academy. For most players, the last legacy dungeon they will have visited before Rhea Lucaria Academy will have been Stormvale Castle, a stony fortress guarded by soldiers, knights, trolls and powerful ranged weaponry. But the academy is a completely different sort of beast. Here, there are no soldiers or knights to speak of, except for Moongrom, because the main foe stalking its halls are scholars, devotees of the sorceress arts who defend their academy with powerful glintstone sorcery fired from staffs, with their faces and heads concealed by their characteristic stone crowns made to resemble the faces of former masters of the academy. As such, this level feels very different to most others, because rather than the enemies here primarily excelling at melee combat with perhaps some secondary ranged skills, the scholars are at their most powerful at range, and far less effective up close, and so combat often feels like a rush to get as close as quickly as possible, dodging their powerful magics along the way. They're not the only enemy here though, because numerous marionette automatons are also scattered throughout the academy's expanse, particularly on the rooftops. Honestly, the most fitting word to describe how I felt right from the very first minute I entered the academy is enchanted. This level is utterly enchanting in every way. Its atmosphere, its gorgeous visuals, and simply the set pieces you move through. There's a fair amount of walking through halls and libraries, sure, but it also has you running and jumping from rooftops, dodging enormous magical boulders, and even descending a massive elevator. The scale and scope of some of these sections is so impressive that I was in a near constant state of wonder when playing through them, and I was constantly amazed at the sheer size of the academy, how rewarding it was to explore and how different it felt to anything else thus far in the game. Truly a magical level and an excellent example of the magic of Elden Ring. And here we are at the top 10 of the list. We've already covered many fucking tremendous levels thus far, but these next 10 are the ones I consider to be the absolute 
greatest levels in all of Soulsborne, which by extension makes them some of the greatest levels in all of gaming. For number 10 I have another example of a level which I think is the best in its respective game, presenting Boletaria's The Inner Ward from Demon Souls. As discussed, Boletaria is my favourite Demon Souls world. The game has a bunch of terrific levels and certainly a few truly iconic ones which made it into the top 40 like Prison of Hope and Island's Edge. And then you have other levels like the ones from the Valley of Defilement which are very memorable for different reasons, but as for Boletaria, it has exactly the shit that I love. Though of its four main levels, the inner ward most effectively concentrates and exhibits those enjoyable elements. It dispenses with the skeletons, depraved ones and miners in favour of powerful soldiers and extremely powerful knights. It ditches the outlandish, fantastical and grim environments in favour of a more conventional, militaristic, castle type setting and it all feels so delightfully solid. There's a vital place for monsters and magic to vary up the journeys within these games, but I really think they tend to be at their best with these more grounded level types, which tend to feel more well honed. Compared to the other levels in Boletaria, everything's that bit stronger here. There are more soldier variants thrown at you, the fat officials make a delightful return after their absence in the Lord's Path, and other than the brief and brutal encounter with one tucked away in the gates of Boataria, this is the level where you start encountering red-eyed knights, who are far more dangerous and damaging than their blue-eyed counterparts found throughout the easier levels of Boataria. Speaking of which, who can forget the long stair section leading up to the penetrator boss fight with a squadron of regular soldiers and a fucking trio of red-eyed knights? Difficult as hell, and as with many moments from Demon Souls, iconic as hell. For as much as I appreciate it, Demon Souls has never been a game that I've loved as a whole. Maybe if it had been my first Souls game, I'd feel differently, but it wasn't my first. But that said, there are absolutely still moments, enemies, and even levels in it that I do love, and the Inner Ward is surely one of those levels. At number 9 I am pleased to present the Undead Burg, which will be most players first proper level after leaving Firelink Shrine, unless they're foolhardy and headstrong enough to delve down the nearby cemetery. I guess it might seem like something of a basic bitch level to put so high in the rankings, but who gives a shit. The Undead Burg is superb, and pretty much a perfect early game level. Right from the get go, your nerves and expectations are thrown asunder when the Hellkite Drake makes its brief appearance before flying off again, and though most of the actual enemies you'll fight in the Undead Burg are far more conventional than the Drake, this is where early game players can really start getting a taste of what the game's about. I'm sure many people watching remember those feelings of uncertainty and confusion in the Undead Burg when you're still wondering what the hell this game even is. What does humanity do? What does Kindle mean? What in the name of all that is holy do all these icons mean on the start screen? Why do I always have my health after being hit? How the hell do I damage this enemy when it has its shield up? What the fuck am I supposed to do when several enemies group on me at once? Who the hell is that guy? I still remember all these feelings keenly, and I also remember how unique and magical the experience of slowly figuring them all out was. Not only through my first playthrough, but through subsequent playthroughs. I think it took until New Game Plus before I learned that invincibility frames were even a thing. I won't get any more carried away with the nostalgia for Dark Souls as a whole though, because this is about the Undead Burg, but for me the Undead Burg was the main arena where all these emotions and impressions were at their strongest. Even aside from my first Dark Souls playthrough though, this level is superb. It's filled with secret areas, shortcuts, parts that look back on themselves, environmental hazards, hidden weapons, a legendary optional combat encounter if you're feeling especially bold, and then they went and threw in perhaps the all-time most well-known and lovable character from the Dark Souls trilogy with Slayer of Astora. And if that wasn't enough, hey, let's toss in a Drake to create perhaps the single most notorious encounter in the game with the bridge section just before the Undead Parish. And let's make it so that if you manage to cut off its tail, you get an awesome early game weapon as a reward for your high cunning and gumption. When people talk about the sheer excellence of the first half of Dark Souls, the Undead Burg is often one of the levels that they're thinking of, because simply put, it is excellent. But now we have my personal favourite level from Dark Souls 1. I hate to reminisce again, like an old man, but way back on my first playthrough I remember fighting my way through one of the game's dark levels, probably the Depths or Blight Town, and having a great time, sure, but also thinking that I probably had a pretty decent idea of what Dark Souls was by now. A good idea of what I could expect from its future levels. Lots of grim locations filled with holes, ghosts or skeletons. But I remember looking up help for one of the game's bosses on YouTube one day and a thumbnail catching my eye. 
The thumbnail showed a level that did not look remotely grim. In fact, it showed a scene from an environment that looked positively pristine, and so I clicked on it and saw someone playing through what we now know as an Orlando. I quickly clicked off and eagerly went back to playing the game with a fresh sense of excitement at what the hell that level was and when I would be getting to it, and indeed, after dying 45 times in Saint Fortress and after beating the Iron Golem, I was gloriously flown into that godly sunlit location, a city of enormous proportions, with vast elevators and colossal mechanisms, and an enormous castle, and imposing sentinels and lightning gargoyles, and silver knights, and for fuck's sake I hate this level and actually know I love it again, because I made it inside the castle and everything's awesome again. Now, I'll say up front that Anna Londo does not have the best level design and layout in Dark Souls 1. The Undead Burg and Painted World have it beaten there for sure, but as far as how great it feels to move through, to explore, Anna Londo has them all beaten. There's no other level in the game I look forward to more than this one, and the anticipation only grows as I walk through these first halls, past the giant sentinels before looking out at the expanse of giant structures before me. It absolutely has a few pain in the arse sections like the rafter bit, the buttress part and that frankly awful room for the titanite demon, but I don't care because I simply love being here. There are so many great moments and amazing scenes and secrets and the main enemy of the level, the silver knights, contribute massively to how enjoyable it all feels. They're certainly not the most challenging enemy in the game, but they're really fun to fight and make for a great occasion to bust out the buckler or target shield and start parrying. And hey, why not go down here and grab Havel's set? And oh look, it's Siegmeier. Anor Londo is a sequence of good times, great moments and excellent set pieces. And when I think of that distinctive Dark Souls 1 excellence, this is the level that always pops into my head first, and rightly so, because while it may not be a 10 out of 10 in every respect, that doesn't matter. It has that special something, and a special place in the hearts of countless fans of the series. A few places earlier I had a level from the first of Dark Souls 3's two DLCs, The Painted World of Ariando, and just a bit earlier than that, I also covered the first level from its second DLC, that being the Dreg Heap. But after the Dreg Heap, and after an intense battle with a demon prince, you are lifted and flown away to the titular ringed city, enshrouded in a haze of sand and mist. At first the place looks extremely grand, perhaps on a similar level to an Orlando, however very quickly after landing you start to see the reality, because like most levels in Dark Souls 3, this place is completely fucked. FromSoft are absolute masters at making incredible first impressions with their levels, and the Ring City is certainly no exception. The way the distant, slumped over giant rises and roars to herald the spectral legions of Rune Knights absolutely blew me away when I first saw it, and also killed me many times because good luck surviving for more than a second when these things are firing a hundred arrows at you. Throughout this entire vast level there's such a powerful and even depressive sense of a lost age, a sense that you have arrived at the end of the world. Hungry, man-sized locusts lurk amongst the shadows in gleeful anticipation of a coming feast. The entire city is slowly sinking down into a fetid mire of sludge, and the only inhabitants of the city are insane, curse-laden pygmies, abyssal harald knights, and in particular, the incredibly formidable ringed knights, with their characteristic ringed armour and weapons, such as the straight sword, the spear, and even their enormous twin great swords. The city itself is extremely grim, even though it certainly does retain elements of its former grandeur throughout its ruined streets, alleys and stairways, but the swamp section in particular is like a sombre concentration of that distinctively apocalyptic Dark Souls 3 flavour. The sight of the giant aimlessly wandering around whilst locusts scuttle around his legs manages to be both beautiful and sad at the same time. And I actually think much the same about the repeat of the fight with the Dragon Slayer armor located at the far side of the swamp, who springs into thunderous animation upon the player's approach. The Dragon Slayer armor is one of my all time favorite bosses, and I was not at all angry about having to fight it again, especially in such a wide, incredible arena, and especially after it dropped its Iron Dragon Slayer set. The Ring City is without a doubt the most difficult level in Dark Souls 3, to the extent that some sections feel just about overwhelming considering both the nature and number of enemies, but really, I wouldn't have it any other way. This was the last ever level from the Dark Souls trilogy, leading up to the last ever boss, and things are supposed to be dialed up to 10, which is absolutely the case here in near every respect. 
the Ring City is more than just an excellent level too because I genuinely feel a bit emotional when moving through it. Not emotional as in I'm weeping, but I mean that the atmosphere here really gets to me and makes for a very powerful gaming experience. An experience that concludes with what is in my opinion the single greatest FromSoft boss fight with Slave Knight Gale. I am of the opinion that Bloodborne's The Old Hunters is the best DLC ever made. Bloodborne is already my favourite FromSoft game, but then they somehow went and bloody topped it. I don't know how they did it, but they did it, and indeed at number 6 I have picked the DLC's opening level, The Hunter's Nightmare. Although it's a ridiculously dangerous place, you can actually come here pretty damn early, right after beating Vicar Amelia in fact, though short of doing a mad dash through the level to grab some treasure, probably best to leave this place till much later. Just as the Royal Wood in Dark Souls 1's DLC took a base game level and made a new, more dangerous version of it, the same is true of the Hunter's Nightmare, which is a corrupted, nightmare version of Central Yharnam and Cathedral Ward. You can recognise certain sections and buildings from the base game, but everything's that bit more fucked up here, with anomalous deposits of strange grey rock there to fill in the gaps. The Hunter's Nightmare is significantly more dangerous than the early game levels it is based on however, and very soon upon entering you will be greeted by an old hunter, and these guys mean business. There are many regular blood drunk hunters scattered around Yarnum, of course, but their weapons, attire and movesets aren't ever unique or distinctive. In fact, they share most of the same attributes as your own player character, except AI controlled. The old hunters are a very different affair though. These guys are much bigger, more ferocious, use old hunter weaponry and have 10 times the personality of any regular hunter, and you'll meet several different variants of them too. Bloodborne has absolutely tremendous enemy variety, especially if you take the Chalice Dungeons into account, which introduces another crap ton of unique enemies and bosses, but despite the wide range of foes the game features, the level of quality in terms of both enemy design and movesets is consistently impressive, and the Old Hunters are among the best of the best. Though the Nightmare Executioners found just outside the Grand Cathedral and in the Blood Lake, leading to the Ludwig boss arena in particular make for one of the most terrifying enemies in the game, and perhaps the most difficult. The one outside the Grand Cathedral in particular is insanely dangerous, especially when it activates its weird buff. The level feels fantastic to traverse through and uniquely dangerous, though the fact that you have a number of awesome new weapons and clothing sets massively incentivizes exploring it all extra thoroughly, because the DLC weapons are some of the coolest shit in the game, stuff like the Beast Cutter and Whirly Gig Saw, both of which you can pick up here. Same with the old Hunter set. Honestly, I came pretty close to putting the Hunter's Nightmare a bit higher ahead of the other still to be mentioned DLC level, but it's not quite perfect. For as gnarly and nightmarish as the River of Blood looks, these bloodsucker enemies are horrible to fight and there are way too many of them, to the extent that I always choose to just run past them. Also, the Dark Cave can be a bit of a bitch, though at the same time they hit another blood-starved beast in here which is undeniably sick, and you can even pick up the Amygdalian arm here, at least after taking out that bloody nightmare of a hunter hidden in this dark recess of this bloody nightmare. And now we have entered the top 5 of the list, with the only levels remaining are ones from Elden Ring, Bloodborne and Dark Souls 3. And speaking of which, I present my all time favourite Dark Souls 3 level, with Lothric Castle. Take everything I adore about the high wall of Lothric and amplify it, make it bigger, more chaotic, more challenging, more apocalyptic, and what you get is Lothric Castle the level leading up to the Grand Archives, which then concludes with the incredible and emotional boss fight with the Twin Princes. There were a good few Lothric Knights at the High Wall, but the ones here hit way harder and have new weapons too, like the Lothric Knight Greatsword, which even does some unexpected lightning damage. These knights are hard enough as it is, but then you also have the cloaked priests who can give them massive buffs to turn even one of them into near unstoppable powerhouses, and woe betide you if you've got more than one of them on you at a time. There are a ton of fantastic moments as you move through Lothric Castle. In fact, the level's a fucking sequence of fantastic moments. 
complemented by powerful soldiers and knights, but the one moment that always stands out to me the most is when you first emerge from the lower section and the sky becomes visible, and you see the bizarre floating forms of the pilgrim butterflies softly ascending higher into the dead red sky, with the scene being made even more apocalyptic and dreadful with the sight of the fully eclipsed sun, now resembling the dark sign of the undead, which is such a genius visual touch by FromSoft that I don't even know what to say. I can't think of a sequence of words sufficiently complimentary or descriptive enough to express how much I love this. This level is seriously difficult too, by far the most difficult in the base game in my opinion, even more so than Arch Dragon Peak. Even the basic soldiers are a real challenge, and there are crossbow wielding halls placed in fiendish locations to catch you with their exploding bolts when you're busy dealing with a different group of enemies, not to mention the dual charms being hurled your way from above in some places to prevent the use of Estes. Although there's a nice homage to Demon's Souls further up in the Grand Archives at the big staircase guarded by multitudes of knights before the boss, there's another one too at the Dragon Bridge, which feels like something of a fiery tribute to the entrance to the aforementioned King's Tower in Demon's Souls. Of course, in this case the dragons aren't really alive, but rather they're merely being given animation by the pus of man, which after being taken out, if you manage not to get cursed to death that is, will result in the dragons freezing in place. There's a heavy Pass of Man theme throughout the castle which also adds to its moribund ambience, the sense that things are spiralling into entropy and that this age of fire is fading, and considering the grim hopeless state of the world, perhaps it should fade. By now I've discussed several Dark Souls 3 levels that I consider to be excellent, but to me Lothric Castle is the greatest among them, and well deserving of a position in the top 5 greatest ever Soulsborne levels. At position number 4 we have the only remaining Bloodborne DLC level, the Research Hall, located in between the Hunter's Nightmare and the Fishing Hamlet. Bloodborne is horrific, and indeed I've discussed its horror elements at length when discussing its many different levels, several of which feature their own distinct themes, like how Kanehurst has quite a different vibe compared to the rest of the game, same with the Fishing Hamlet. But another example of a level which I feel is especially distinct is the Research Hall. This is the true face of the healing church, and it ain't pretty. In fact, it might just be the single most horrific and disturbing level in Bloodborne, because the dominant theme here is one of medical horror. There are no beasts anywhere in the research hall, but rather, other than a few bothersome rodents and crows along the rafters at the top, and the odd church servant, you will exclusively be fighting test subjects, whose most defining visual characteristic are their grotesquely bloated heads. In their attempts to create a celestial emissary, the church researchers injected water into people's heads, believing that this would transform them into beings capable of communing with the Great Ones. And while the choir would later go on to perfect this procedure, we know that it resulted in only failure here, hence the presence of the living failures just ahead and the absence of any actual celestial emissaries like we see in the waking world. As a result of these experiments, most of the test subjects are completely and utterly insane and violent, blindly charging, flailing and shrieking at any other living thing to cross their path, and there are a lot of these enemies, some clothed, some naked, some entirely headless, and some where all that's left of them are their heads. The most disturbing of all though are the ones that haven't quite gone fully insane, still retaining some ability to speak providing little watery droplets of insight into the nature of the experiments and their mushy, murky after effects. The best example of this is of course Saint Adeline, who you can gather brain fluid for in exchange for her saint's blood, and ultimately the milkweed room, making for one of the most fucked up side quests in Soulsborne history. As utterly, wonderfully dark and dismal as the research hall's atmosphere is though, its layout is just as incredible, bordering on genius, not to mention unique. The name of the game here is Verticality. The level is composed of multiple floors, accessible by twisting staircases, with some rooms connecting to others, either laterally or vertically, while other rooms require keys or must be opened from the inside. Furthermore, at the very top of the hall, there's a mechanism that shifts the staircases into a new alignment, essentially changing the layout of the whole level so that new sections are now available for exploration, and as if it needed saying, I fucking love this so much. Even without this mechanism, the level was top tier, but this puts it over the damn edge into top 5 territory, and even very nearly into top 3, but alas, there's some stiff competition. Well, here we go folks. 
What better level to choose for number 3 in my list than perhaps the greatest castle FromSoft has ever created, Stormvale Castle. I was of course pretty freaking impressed with Elden Ring as I rode around Lindgrave on the back of Torrent, exploring its ruins, fighting its field bosses and meeting its many excellent NPCs. But all the while, the immense form of Stormvale Castle was visible in the distance, a solid and imposing fortress of wind-blasted stone. And so eventually I said, the time has come, let's go to Stormvale. And go to Stormvale I did to one of the most incredible levels I've ever had the pleasure of playing through. I know we didn't see it coming either, not that I didn't expect a high quality level, but while the region I'd just been exploring was so open, the castle felt significantly more like a traditional Dark Souls level, except even larger and more intricate. First things first, Stormville Castle is absolutely huge. Sometimes in these games you might see a level or location in the distance and it looks sick as hell but upon actually getting there most of it isn't really explorable, if there instead being a dedicated route through it all. In fact, for as much as I love it, that is essentially the case with Anor Londo, but with Stormvale, no, it's all accessible. You can go through the main gate and brave your way through the guns and soldiers or you can go through the hole in the wall and infiltrate the castle via the wedges. You can jump around on high battlements and towers, or you could descend deep down into the castle's dark, gloomy depths to uncover its deathly secrets, and it all feels so right. And despite how many times I've explored through it all, there are still some spots that I've never been able to get to, though I love that I know that I can get to them. It feels like a massive castle should feel to explore, and just as dangerous too. The level is filled with exiled soldiers and banished knights who make use of the distinctive storm techniques used by all inhabitants of the castle, even Godric himself. There are horrors here too though, if you got absolutely annihilated by the grafted scion at the Chapel of Anticipation, which let's face it, nearly everyone did, then you can have your revenge in the hall with the large portrait of Godfrey, grimly adorned with the hanging limbs of Tarnished. Awesome enemy, but I'll be honest, I still have no goddamn idea how to actually fight it without using up nearly all my crimson flasks or dying. Stormvale Castle is just about perfect, and was the perfect choice for the game's first legacy dungeon, though it also has the undesired effect of making the game's other castle levels feel kinda lame in comparison, but I won't hold that against it. At number 2 we are back with Bloodborne, and in fact it happens to be the first level the player enters out into after leaving ISFK's clinic. It is central Yarnum. There are for sure more nightmarish, more horrific and more challenging levels from Bloodborne that I could have chosen for this spot, but its introductory level is just too damn strong for me to choose anything else. Right as you enter out into the city, there's this thick atmosphere of hostility and oppression, even before you encounter any Yarnamites. The form of the city's very architecture and the rubble, ruin and coffins which decorate the streets communicates a sense of wrongness that only grows stronger the farther you travel into the city, especially after getting the lowdown of the hunt from Gilbert, a fellow Scotsman. Indeed, half-mad gangs of Yarnamites stalk the streets, wielding makeshift weaponry and holding torches, eager to hunt down any outsiders. Yarnamites are fiercely xenophobic, and the Healing Church did their best to stoke this hatred by blaming the Beast Scourge on foreigners, instead of owning up to their own role in the city's downfall. As such, even the non-hostile NPCs you can interact with who hide behind their doors are still very hostile to you, if not physically so, all to convey to the player what kind of a place Yarnum is, and what kind of a place it was even before this latest, most apocalyptic scourge of beasts. Some enemies even call you a beast, despite the fact that most of them are at least partially transformed into beasts themselves, while some have fully undergone their bestial transformations with the only evidence of their former humanity being a scrap or two of filthy clothing clinging to their blood matted fur. Structurally, Central Yarnum also feels incredibly refined, with multiple routes through the city, even featuring a completely optional boss with the Cleric Beast at the other end of the Great Bridge. If you were brave enough to try and make it past the two Scourge Beasts that is, the bane of many a first time Bloodborne player. There's also the sewer section which boasts a range of completely different enemies to those found at the surface, as well as additional hidden sections into and through central Yarnum, complemented by a number of shortcuts to make getting through it that bit more manageable, cause for a starting area, central Yarnum pulls no punches. Even one of these Yarnamites is more than capable of taking you down, never mind the ten or so at least of them huddled around the flaming beast pyre near the beginning. 
Sertro Yarnum showcases the very essence of Bloodborne. Sure, the game goes into far wilder, weirder territory later on, and the themes become increasingly cosmic and Lovecraftian, but at its core, Bloodborne is a game set within the night of the hunt, the cruelest and bloodiest hunt Yarnum has ever seen, and this level is where it all starts, with its prowling packs of frenzied butchers and blood-crazed beasts. Beasts all over the shop. You'll be one of them, sooner or later. Here we are folks, we have made it to number one, the level which I consider to be the single greatest Soulsborne level. It's probably not the most surprising pick, but I'm not really trying to be surprising or subversive with my picks here. I'm just trying to tell you what I actually think, and the level I think is most deserving of the number one spot is of course Elden Ring's Landell, Royal Capital. Right from the outset, Landell seeks to enchant with its scale and sheer golden glory, its sombre soundtrack, and the weird but strangely beautiful oracle enemies complementing the soundtrack with their soft piping. I'm sure everyone remembers that first moment where you enter the city and take it all in and wonder, holy shit, can I actually explore all that? Well, yes, you can, and that's one of the things that makes Landell so special. It's utterly expansive, yet completely accessible, whether you're jumping across rooftops, stalking through the lower alleys, or even climbing up the colossal wings of the dead dragon Gransax, whose corpse has become a permanent feature of the city. Not to mention the equally impressively sized bolt of Gransax, which can even be climbed up unless you fall off it twice. All through the game up until this point, you can see the earth tree standing several times higher than everything else, distant, incandescent, and seemingly completely out of reach, but then you get to Altus Plateau and all of a sudden, it's looking a great deal bigger and a hell of a lot closer, and then once you set foot in Landell, especially as you climb higher up the Earth Tree Sanctuary and beyond, the tree's true enormity comes into full view, and it's way bigger and more mighty than you probably thought it was. The way the Earth Tree grows in size based on your perspective is such a subtle yet at the same time blatant measure of the player's progress through the first half of the game, and I know many players even thought they might have been coming to the end of the game upon arriving in Landell, and no wonder when you consider the sheer scale and quality of the experience here. Of course, there's a wide range of formidable enemies to contend with through the city's reaches, from Landell soldiers to Landell knights, broken gargoyles, a fucking air tree avatar which falls out of the sky, misbegotten, pages, perfumers, fingers creepers, an omen killer and probably some other stuff I've forgotten about. The general Altus Plateau region can definitely feel a bit too easy if you've been exploring thoroughly before getting here, and the same is true of Landell, but even if you are a tad over leveled by the time you make it to the capital, it doesn't at all ruin the enjoyment of taking on these excellent enemies, and it certainly doesn't spoil the sight of the city's most mysterious inhabitants in the form of the white-robed Oracle Envoys. Elden Ring is an extremely colour-focused game, with different levels, regions and even incantations and magic having their own colour themes, but the dominant colour theme of the game is of course gold, bright, divine gold, and Landell is where this golden theme is at its strongest. Just as I inferred that Central Yarnum is bloodborne in its purest form, I'd say the exact same about Landell Royal Capital. Stormville Castle may be the ultimate castle level, and in my view the third best Soulsborne level full stop, but I consider Landell to be the ultimate level full stop, and I ain't ashamed to say it. Oh my fucking god, ladies and gentlemen, it's done. We did it. It took about five hours, but we worked our way through the worst of the worst to the best of the best and had a hell of a lot of fun doing it, I hope. I was pretty apprehensive about doing this series after my video ranking all the Soulsborne bosses, but I'm really glad I went through with it, even if it was a lot of work, because I love talking about these games and letting people know what I think in a light-hearted way. 
As for my picks, well, I'm sure there was plenty here that folk agreed with, and plenty that folk most certainly did not agree with. I know that me putting the Iron Keep ahead of Erythil of the Boreal Valley ruffled a few feathers, but look, who gives a shit? Ultimately, the order was determined by which levels I found the most enjoyable, and that's going to be different for everyone, which is the way it should be. In fact, if I redid this list a few months from now, it might well look pretty different from its current form. Maybe I'd even change my mind about the subterranean shunning grounds. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, while I could ramble on for another several minutes, I think it's best if I end the whole saga there. For those of you who've stuck with this series all the way through, I just want to say that I'm really grateful that you like my stuff and that you've spent so much time listening to the sound of my voice. If you told me a year ago that I would be making 5 hour videos and that people would actually be watching them, I'd have said, yeah right buster, but here we are. Before we fade out, please allow me to give an extra big thank you to my kind patrons for supporting the channel. And on that note, as always, cheers for watching and cheerio.